Just want to see who jumped the most there. All right, we'll call Education K-12 uh, subcommittee to order. Um, we have, uh, Madam Clerk, go ahead and take the roll. Representative Carringer. Representative Cassida. Here. Chairman Sapicki. Here. Representative Clemens. Representative Hurt. Here. Representative Love. Here. Chairman Reagan. Here. Chairman White. Here. Chairman Haston. Here. Chairman, you have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, do we have any personal orders before we begin? Chair. Yeah. Representative Kastner. Good friend and our uh, director of schools for Franklin Special is in the crowd, Dr. David Snowden, and uh, welcome him and appreciate what he does for us. <laughs> Chairman Watt. If there's anybody else on the committee, but I was just talking to this, the Cleveland Bradley Chamber of Commerce students here today. And uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, anybody want to uh, say anything more about them that's Leading the group. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Anybody else? All right, let's take a look at the calendar. A few updates we'll go through uh, before we uh, start off. Um, item. <laughs> item number, was it five? five? Item number five, House Bill 2292 is off notice. Um, House Bill, item number 10, House Bill 1000 is off notice. And I believe that's all that's off notice, right? That's the only two we have off notice right now. So that brings us to item number one, House Bill 2143. Do I have a motion? motion Properly motioned. And uh, Chairman White, you were recognized on House Bill 2143. And I do believe you have uh, an amendment to start us off with there. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Uh, we'll start to make sure we're on the right amendment. We introduced the bill two weeks ago. The uh, main amendment is 15591. That, that is correct. Do I have a motion on the amendment? Motion. Second. Properly motion. Chairman White, you are recognized to explain your amendment. Thank you, uh, Chairman and Committee. Committee, y'all remember, you remember from two weeks ago, this is the uh, school basic education funding formula, which we're calling TISA. This is the one where basically won't go into a lot of detail today. We have the commissioner here as well as the department and to go into a lot of the details. But this is the bill that after 30 years, we're looking at how we fund our K through 12 system. Uh, the three priorities are empower each student to read by grade three, prepare each high school graduate to succeed in higher education or career of the graduate choice, and provide each student with the resources to succeed regardless of the student's individual circumstances. And it's based on four elements of funding the base fund, the student weight funding formula, the direct funding, and the outcome funding. Over the last two weeks since introduced, uh, I have, we have put it out for many people to comment on. I have a lot of uh, comments and things, and we've got several amendments to introduce today. The department has been listening, and the administration has been listening to uh, the feedback, and we'll talk about those, but that is where we are at this juncture with uh, with that particular bill, the thank TISA you, bill. Thank you, Chairman Watt. Um, and uh, does anybody have any questions on this amendment? Of course, we're going to be in a, a, a lot of discussions about this bill today. Uh, so without objection, we'll go ahead and adopt this amendment. Um, without objection, we'll be voting uh, to adopt Amendment 15591. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. The ayes have it. And the amendment is adopted. I believe that takes us to the next amendment that was uh, on the list. I believe it's amendment number two in, uh, on your mark calendars. And what is that drafting code, Chairman Watt? That is a drafting code 016168. Do I have an, a motion on this amendment? Properly motion. Uh, Chairman Watt, you are recognized on uh, your amendment. Uh, would you like to explain it? 
Okay, this amendment, the first of, uh, we have three today. The first is, it's a compilation of things that the Department of Administration heard that they have, uh, want to amend to the bill. I would like to ask DOE to be the ones to go over this. It's, it's uh, about 12, 13 items. If it's okay with them, instead of me just going, going through the list, they may have questions of the committee anyway, if, if that'd be okay. I will, uh, I will go to Chairman Sapicki first for a quick question uh, or comment. Chairman Haston and Chairman White, I think there's other amendments that are going to go on this also. Would it be better just to have all the amendments on there and then they can just give us a blanket statement of everything at one time? Without objection, I think that that would be prudent if the, if, if the committee so wills it. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and take up this amendment and then discuss briefly the next one. And if there's some questions in between, we're fine doing that. But I think that that's a, a wise approach if uh, the committee's okay with that. Um, motion to adopt the amendment. Second. Probably motion. Um, without objection, we'll be voting to adopt amendment 16168. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. As opposed to say no, the ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. Um, that takes us to the second amendment, uh, or I'm sorry, amendment three in your uh, on your calendars. Um, I believe it's drafting code 16174. Chairman Watt, is that what you have? Mm -hmm. That is, yes, also right. one. Go one, ahead, you're one, recognized motion. on that amendment. Second. Properly motion. Go ahead, Chairman Watt. Okay, this changes the definition of fiscal capacity calculation to both the CBER and the TASR model. As you know, there were some questions about we were going mainly with CBER, but this uh, puts it back under the CBER and TASR as far as the fiscal capacity. Motion to adopt. Second. All right, properly motion. All those in favor of adopting Amendment 16174 indicate by saying aye. Aye. All those opposed say no. The ayes have it. The amendment is adopted. And that brings us to uh, amendment number four, uh, drafting code 16176. I believe if that is correct, Chairman White, you are recognized on that amendment. Do we have a motion? Second. Probably motion, Chairman White, you are recognized. And that is the correct amendment number 16176. And committee, what this does is removes the public charter school students from the weighted funding allocation and moves them into the direct funding allocation as they are currently in the BEP. And with that, I renew the motion. All right, without objection, we'll be voting to adopt Amendment 16176. All those in favor, indicate by saying aye. aye. All those opposed say no, the ayes have it. And the amendment is adopted. Um, we will, without objection, have legal roll all of these into one amendment. Do I need to hit the gavel on that? They tell me I have to hit the gavel when I say that, so we'll roll that into one amendment. Now it's official. Um, with that, Chairman White, uh, we do have um, uh, in committee, we do have uh, some people down to testify. Uh, without objection, we will go ahead and go out of session and begin taking up some of the list of the people that had uh, had uh, requested this within the 24-hour period that uh, we require. So without objection, we will go out of session. And I will. Uh, we will begin with um, David Connor. Uh, and we will uh, invite him up. And just for the record, please make sure you state your name and uh, who you represent. And uh, we do have a three-minute uh, testimony time frame on these, uh, just to keep that in mind. Go right ahead. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairman, committee members. I'm uh, David Connor, Executive Director of the Tennessee County Services Association. So I'm here on behalf of your, we consider ourselves your local funding partners in funding K-12 education. Uh, we represent the county commissioners, county mayors across the state. <clears throat> uh, and somebody had asked me that they're like, you're on the list, but it doesn't show if you're supporting or you're opposing. And it's like, okay, if I'm a traffic light, I'm not a green, I'm not a red, we're kind of like a flashing yellow, which is just like, please, let's make sure we get this right. Uh, we're at a really unique moment in time. The last two governors have both thought about making major revisions to education funding. And what they didn't have in place at the time was a large amount of funding to invest into it. Because if you don't have that, otherwise you're kind of picking winners and losers. And some of the things that I know are being considered in the amendments, like the fiscal capacity and other matters, it's like, you know, how does that affect our members? Well, well, 20 counties do better under this one, but 30 counties do worse. And then, you know, so it's, it puts us in a difficult position. But um, like I said, you all do have, uh, very fortunately, our state has a great surplus due to its financial management right now. There is an opportunity to put money in, and I don't want to, um, 
I don't want to be short about the fact of saying we are very appreciative of the large investment that the governor and the, and the General Assembly is looking at making in, in K-12 education right now. That's very much appreciated by local government. I'd, I'd like to spend more time on that, but I got three minutes. So uh, I do want to touch on two things. One is something I want to point out that this is not fixing that has been an issue with the BEP. Um, if you look at the BEP, one of the biggest complaints from the local government side is we don't feel like it funds all the positions. There's about, depending on the year, 10 or 11,000 positions outside the BEP that local school systems fund. Um, so that's been a frustration. Now there are some things in here definitely improving the uh, ratios on nurses, on counselors. It is, is at possibly adding some additional teachers into the base. but. Um, it takes a huge amount of money to cover all those positions, and that's not entirely getting resolved under this. I think the flip side of that coin and the frustration that often you all have as a General Assembly is you put money in for teacher raises, and then you're frustrated by the time it gets to the local level, those teachers are saying they're not seeing it in their paychecks. And I think those two are related. Um, unfortunately, I don't know that this is fixing that either, because we're sort of moving away from a system where you know how many positions you're funding, and you know what the salary is in the BEP for what we're looking at for those positions, so you can make adjustments to that. When we go to this base funding amount per pupil, if you want to put money into teacher salaries now, you got to put it into the base and earmark it, and then that triggers an investment in the weights, and then all of that triggers a local 30 percent match on all of that. So. Um, it's going to be difficult to be able to say that we're putting the money directly where we want it to go, uh, so that issue is not going to be resolved. Um, the last thing I'll say to be respective of time, very much appreciate this and I understand the focus on we need to focus on put students absolutely first and foremost when we're funding education. I hope as we move forward, either through the legislation or through the rules the department looks at, we are careful that we don't end up monetizing our students. And what I mean by that is, we have to be careful about incentives we create because we see that in a lot of places. You could, you could end up incentivizing schools to over-identify special education or over-identify kids with certain needs. You could incentivize schools to go out and start trying to get kids signed up for benefits in order to qualify them as economically disadvantaged, things like that. Those are things we hopefully can guard against. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Connors. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Representative Clemens, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Connor, I don't know if you can answer this question or not, but the several representations have been made by the Department of Education with regards to this question and answer. So if we were to maintain the BEP as it exists today, and this body were to appropriate a billion new dollars into the BEP as it exists today, how much would that trigger for cumulatively for the counties to, to put in? Total. There would be different um, answers to that depending on exactly how you put it into the formula. I think if you put it all into saying we're going to take the salary component and push the salary component up, that might trigger more. Uh, we had someone take a look at what if you add additional positions and you try to cover as many of those 10 or 11,000 positions in the BEP. Um, that might not have as much of an effect. We do think there are some counties that are funding right at that local match level that no matter what you do and you invest, you're going to require them to put in more. But most of the systems across the state are filling, uh, funding well above that local match, so it wouldn't necessarily trigger an increase. Um, we, we've looked at one way of doing it, and it may be as little as like 10 or 15 million. Well, I mean, not for a billion, but you could put maybe 700 million in and not trigger much locally. Um, I will say in the past when governors have looked at major new investments into education funding, there are ways too you could put a circuit breaker in there to say we're putting all this in right now and for this year we're not going to require a match because local governments don't have the, the, the big largesse that the state does right now. So, uh, Representative Clemens. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So I just want to get clarification. So if there, you said there was a scenario where it would only be 10 to $15 million cumulatively across the state because of, because I know Nashville, for instance, I mean, we put in well above and we fund positions well outside the BEP. So explain to me what the situation whereby we put in 700 million or so, and it would only trigger a 10 to $15 million increase across the entire state. I mean, I think that it's similar to what's being looked at in TISA. Now, TISA is looking at resetting that local match even lower to try to guard against raises for a number of three or four years. I said, when we looked at this, so many systems are above the local match that when the state puts this money in, the local match has to go up, but you're already funding well above it. So it wouldn't necessarily trigger a local tax increase. Um, there are a number of systems right near that match that would have to, but 
uh, the way we looked at it, it was not that large of an increase. One more, and then we'll move on. Re Representative Clemens. Thank you, Chairman. And and so, right, we're lowering that local match now for the next few years, and it's going to step up over the next four years, as best I understand it. So, what happens after year four, as you understand this legislation? I've seen different scenarios and some projections for out years that didn't show any local increase, but I think those were based on holding state funding flat. Uh, and we all expect, and I think you all have had a track record of you, you add it more every year. Um, so, I, I mean, I think there are some systems that, that would have been the first year or two, they're already being affected. Um, and certainly by the time we get to year four, or so others are there. Um, that's difficult for us now to really make a good projection on under the new formula as to where it's going to go. Is it is it going to be higher than what it would have been under the BEP? And I've heard some folks say, no, it's probably about the same amount of growth. Um, that's It's difficult for us to tell because there's, it's such a significant change in how it's calculated. Thank you. Chairman Sapiki. Thank you for coming today. Um, are, are you Are you asking us to be more prescriptive in the bill? on what the ratios are for nurses, on social workers, on students to teachers, would that help you be, would that help the locals spend the money more efficiently? Or should we just leave it at the discretion of the locals to ma make that decision for their own on what best fits their individual needs of the 147 different LEAs across the state? Uh, thank you for the question. I, I, I think, we're supportive in general of the idea that the local school systems need to make those decisions about the priorities and where it needs to be spent. When I, when I was mentioning about uh, how the, there are improvements into the teacher ratio and the nursing ratio and some of those, it, that's going to help close that gap right now where the local systems complain that we're having to hire a lot more people outside the formula. It's bringing some folks into the formula. I don't think it's bringing the full amount. And that, that's a discussion maybe to be made, that, that maybe some of those need to come into the formula, some of those are still a local uh, discretion on additional positions that you feel like shouldn't be funded at the state level, so. Chairman Sapiki. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so if we, give, if we give maximum latitude at the state level of the funding formula, and we give a pay raise on the base funding amount, which is going to trigger a recalculation of all those weighted measures. If the student that is being served, let's just hypothetically say a dyslexia student, is identified on one of those uh, uh, um, learning calculations, we change the base amount. That student that is currently in that dyslexia line, their needs are being met because we've already funded that. But by the recalculation of that, there's now extra money available there to the LEA. Could the LEA not use that money to help close the teacher salary ratios? Uh, the teacher position ratio, sorry about that. That is my understanding. As much as I've heard this described, they're saying this is gonna continue to be a funding formula and not a spending plan, so it's mm -hmm. not gonna dictate how the money is used. Um, yeah, so. And la last one, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead. So, hypothetically, for four years, the General Assembly, since I've been here every year, we've given a pay raise every year. Some, some greater than others, some less than others, but we've given a pay raise every year since I've been here. I know there's members been here a lot longer than I have. It's pretty much become a custom that the General Assembly gives pay raises to teachers every year. In the new, in the new base funding formula, every time we give a pay raise, it triggers all the new calculations of, of the weighted measures. You with me? If we do this for four years, give pay raises for four years, and we give the normal adjustments like we do with the BEP for cost of things changing in year five, when the supports of the state start to wane, and this becomes a true funding formula ratio between the state and the locals, four years of pay raises, four years of increases, I don't know what, you can't tell me what it is, but it's going to change the bottom line of, of the locals, correct? That, that's the concern we're hearing from our members. It's, it's that four year, five year, six year, where are we? are we? Have we reached the base to such a point that when it grows, it really starts to hit the local tax base? That's a concern they have, and I don't know how to answer it. And, and But in the BEP right now, if we do give a pay raise, it still changes the locals match too. It correct? Can, yes, yes. Thank you. Chairman Watt. 
Thank you, Chairman. And that's where I want to kind of develop the thought, Representative Pickey. You made a statement to begin with as one of the concerns is you do not feel like it covers all staffing positions. And that was one of the weaknesses of the BEP is that it was based upon ratios and then the locals had the flexibility to do what they feel like they need to do. So now under this model, the TISA model, we are at least funding based upon the weight of the, the type of students that each district has. So my question is, could we ever fully fund the staffing of the locals based upon what the locals may decide to do, no matter what formula we come up with? That, that's a good question. I, I would say there's going to be certain aspects of funding that I don't know that it is appropriate for the state to, to play a role in. I mean, if, if a system wants to have all sorts of additional teachers and they've got the funding and the resources to do it and, and offer some different types of foreign languages that there's a very low demand for or different types of high-level science or math classes that there's a low demand for, I mean, maybe the state shouldn't be paying for those teachers and that's considered like a luxury for the local system. Um, I, I guess the point I was trying to make earlier is that moving completely away from this, under the system now I can say you've got so many kids in this grade, so that's generating this number of teachers. You're actually hiring 20 more on top of that at, for whatever reason, and we can at least make that comparison. Un, under here it's going to be this kid's getting 6860, that kid's getting 7840, that kid, and, you know, and I don't know how to add that up to determine how many teachers it is and isn't paying for. Uh, I think it's going to be difficult to make those comparisons and, and keep track of that in the future. Okay, thank you. Representative Love. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Chairman Sapicki raised a question about the prescriptive amount or ratio for nurses, social workers, counselors, and classrooms. I know one of the issues, I believe, that uh, LEAs have had and the school boards and districts is needing more school nurses, counselors, social workers. The money being put in but not necessarily describing or prescribing that a certain ratio can be achieved in the language of the bill uh, does give you more flexibility. My concern would be that when the costs start to increase in year four or five or six, that because it's not prescriptive, that may be the first place you pull from in order to reduce some costs uh, because now you know that you don't have to uh, spend money in that certain area. Uh, not projecting this on any of the, the districts, but I'm saying when we don't prescribe those areas, uh, then it becomes a little bit more uh, difficult to maybe save some of those areas because it's not in law. Does what I'm saying make sense? It does. I, mean, I think with respect to like school nurses, right now the ratio is so large that the systems are hiring many more nurses than the formula is generating. So I, mean, I think it's, they're not going to back off of that. They, they've seen that and the COVID has only made us more aware of the fact that the importance of a school nurse and how critical they are to the academic side of things. So I, mean, I think that's out there. Um, that is a challenge. I mean, we, we saw this with some school systems when the state looked to go to RTI and to do that as a way to really help those kids who are struggling. There wasn't a lot of funding initially, and that's one of the things the BP Review Committee has made some recommendations about is to improve RTI funding because some counties saw that and they're looking at it like, we need that, we need RTI instruction. We're not getting the funding for it, and I think that was one of the things some of our rural systems ended up getting money that was meant to go into teacher salaries, and there may have been an expectation it was going to go to raises, and instead they used it to hire additional teachers to get more RTI instructors. So um, I, th I think our systems, our school boards working with the county commissions are trying to figure out what do our students really need. I think that's what their focus is right now. Um, and I said, I appreciate the fact that that is the focus of this formula. I appreciate the fact that the, the department is trying to give as much flexibility to the locals as they, as they need. I think it's, um, the, the, there will be those decisions in the future, particularly whether it's a fast growing system trying to keep up with school growth and having to build new buildings or whether it's a system that's got declining growth and how do we manage the fact that we're gonna have to lay off some teachers and rearrange the kids or, you know, there's, there's 
on both ends of the spectrum, the, the systems are struggling with how to manage those needs and maintain them. And I think that will always be a part of it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Connor. I appreciate you coming in today. Uh, next on our list, uh, we have uh, Stephen Puckett. There we go. Let's make sure that uh, you state your name for the record and who you represent, and uh, it'll be a, a three-minute uh, limit, and then we'll open it up for questions. There it is. All right. Uh, my name is uh, Stephen Puckett. I'm a private citizen from Hendersonville, Tennessee. I'm here as a concerned citizen and uh, and as a taxpayer. Uh, I speak for myself, but I'm sure there's others that agree with me. Um, anytime there's a new funding formula, of course, there's going to be a lot of questions. Um, I've been looking at this from the beginning, and there's a lot of concerns when it comes to this notion of dollars versus effective dollars. Um, you know, it's one thing one thing to say that, well, we've got, you know, nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars, but the thing is that may sound good, but if it costs ten thousand dollars to actually provide the service, then you've wasted nine thousand nine hundred and ninety nine dollars. And so measuring based on dollars per student is not highly effective as say measuring time per student which is a much more clear measure. The BEP kind of splits the difference with the ratios where you can actually measure time per student based on classroom size and things like that. And you can actually see cannibalization at time, especially with our social workers, our um, you know, nurses and everything like that, where you can see through the actuality, the cannibalization at time. The second major issue with this is that it fails to account for dynamic risk. Uh, it actually shares this problem with the BEP in that we don't have core curriculum like uh, communications or foreign language, which would address the ESL issue as the ESL risk, as well as um, different kinds of communication issues such as speech therapy, uh, dyslexia, things like that that are part of the special education program and that you currently have to pull students out of another class, like say in my case, pulled out of science for speech therapy. That could be incorporated in that curriculum. The last one is probably the biggest one, and that is uh, the dishonesty issue. Um, this funding formula is designed almost in every component for opportunities for dishonesty. It's, um, it's results-based issue can actually promote academic dishonesty. We already have major problems with the draconian penalty system we have. This would supercharge that and has been demonstrated in other places that implemented it. Academic dishonesty versus economic dishonesty are, in, are key, key in difference. Academic dishonesty injures the student while economic dishonesty, which would be a student getting patented for work they didn't do or published for work they didn't do because the teacher fleshed out an idea, would provide economic reward to the student, something I presented um, previously on an anth when we were discussing lunch issues. Um, also, the direct funding, there's concern about the flexibility the governor would have in that if the governor changed direct funding from one item to another, it may the locals may be forced by the parents to have to raise taxes to address that. That creates dynamic issues at the local level. And so, as well as questions about whether or not the compartmentalization, uh, Chairman Sapicki was kind of talking about that with the, the, fun, the uh, for, formulas, you know, legislating it. We, part of the reason why the BEP had 46 components is because we found throughout 30 years that school systems were not using money as the legislature intended. And so we have to recognize, are those line items going to be legally restricted or are we going to, or are we going to go back to the square one where the school systems are free for all? So those are mine. Thank you, Mr. Puckett. Um, does anybody have any questions for our guests? Seeing none, appreciate you taking the time and coming in and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you, Mr. Puckett. And that brings us, I think we have three that we'll bring up at the same time. Is it, uh, we have three 
uh, Jacob, uh, Jacob Sorrels or Sorrells, I've known, I've kn Sorrells, I've, I've known both uh, pronunciations, Justin Owen and Elizabeth Brown, if they would uh, come on up to the, uh, to the table here and uh, just start off by introducing each, uh, each one of yourselves and who you represent, and then uh, we'll start down at the right and, and work across for your comments. It'll be uh, three minutes each, and then we'll open it up for any questions. Uh, thank you. I'm Jacob Sorrells. I represent uh, Marshall County Schools. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Brown, and I am a senior at Coffee County Central High School. I'm Justin Owen, as he's mentioned. Um, I'm really here to represent the students uh, of Marshall County. Uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to be here. Uh, thank you to the committee. Uh, thank you to the governor uh, for his bold initiative. Uh, and thank you to the commissioner and the Department of Education. Uh, for their uh, willingness to listen to us, the feedback that we've, we've gotten, and the information that we have received. I appreciate everyone. So please pass this for the students of Marshall County. Uh, we need additional funding for our students. Um, you may ask, what will we do with that? And I can tell you, it didn't take me long. Uh, when we first got our allocation, Marshall County stands to get about $6 million dollars. It was pretty easy for me to just scratch out really, really quickly um, what we would do with that. And, of course, I have to ask my board. I'm, I'm not the end-all, be-all in Marshall County. But um, the recommendations I would make to them are, are these. You know, we got some one-time funding federal money, uh, COVID money, ESSER funds. Uh, that was one-time money. Uh, it was hard to spend that on recurring funds. Uh, and, but we've hired 10 additional teachers in K-3. Like you, we agree that early literacy is important. So we pushed in 10 additional staff members to lower that student-teacher ratio to try to teach our students how to read. I don't think there's anything more important than what we do there. We, uh, but when we did that, we're telling these people as we hire them, this job's gone June 30th, 2024, because we can't guarantee that money. So the first thing I can do with $6 million is keep those folks, okay? I can, I can keep them people. We also uh, added two new social workers. I can keep them as well. Um, raises, we can give a substantial raise uh, with this money. Uh, and that raise would go to our staff to help attract and retain staff, keep staff that we have now. Right now, uh, we have more teachers on permits than we've ever had. I'm sure the state can tell you. Um, that they have processed more permits than they ever have. I can't speak for them, but I feel like that's the case. Uh, so we need to attract and retain qualified staff and be able to keep them. I understand that the state of the world now, across all sectors of the economy, uh, is struggling to find staff, right? But what's best for our students is qualified staff. Um, we need to be able to pay these folks. Uh, we can also add new positions. So, again, I know that uh, in your literacy bill, we're going to have to give uh, low-ratio tutoring, 3-1 tutoring, uh, for the third graders uh, who aren't uh, proficient. We can hire staff to do that. Uh, there's, we can give it. With the money we have, I, I don't know what the amendment's going to do, right? When you, when you throw the uh, TASSER back in, the, obviously that's going to change uh, the amount of funds that I think we're going to get. And it's only a five-year average anyway. Um, but we can add in uh, several, at least 12 new positions. Um, that would be something I would go back and talk to my school board, uh, talk to my uh, principals and staff, how we're going to allocate this out. Um, and you, you might ask, you know, why now? Uh, why, why can't this just wait? And I understand uh, you need to be thorough. I understand the accountability. You can't just throw a mil a, you know, billion new dollars at us and, and, and walk away. Um, and expect nothing in return. I get that. Um, and I appreciate the new money the governor's given us this year, but it's going to be a really hard sell when I go back home. Uh, I would love to be able to walk my budget this year with this knowing this is passed and about how much money I'm going to get because it's going to be difficult to keep, retain the people I have with a 1% or 2% raise, right? So I'm going to have to have those conversations or maybe no race. 
this year with my folks, it sure would be nice if I knew, hey, we're going to get six million more dollars for next year. Look at all these other things I can do. I, I can't do it right now, but we will be able to do it. I can try. Thank you. And we'll, we're going to come back for some questions here in a minute. You can go, go right ahead with your comments. Good afternoon. I had the honor of serving as the chair of the Student Engagement Subcommittee, and I want to extend a special thank you to Governor Lee and Commissioner Schwinn for giving me this amazing opportunity. Being a part of the subcommittee gave students an opportunity to be heard, and trust me, students love to use their voices and be heard, because who better to know the needs of students than students themselves? We had a perspective that no other, no other subcommittee had because we are in the classroom and in the hallways with our peers every single day and we hear their needs. Students had a hand in helping craft components to consider in this formula. And I think it says a lot about the Department of Education that they allowed students to be a part of the process. It speaks volumes that they care about our needs because as students, I know that sometimes we often can feel underappreciated, so we really thank the Department of Education for giving this opportunity to share our needs. Now is the time to move forward with the student-based funding model. First, the last time we reevaluated the funding model was 30 years ago. A lot has changed in 30 years. I wasn't even thought of 30 years ago, and I'm a senior in high school now. It's necessary to meet current needs because like I mentioned, needs have changed. We have been advancing in technology and things like career technical education and work-based learning have become so big in public education now. I personally am the Tennessee FBLA state president, so I advocated very diligently for CTE funding. <coughs> there has been changes in industry, so it's time for something that will meet those current needs. In addition, Unfortunately, some of our students can feel unprepared for their future. With so much going on in our world now, students miss out on opportunities to learn life skills. So we as students feel more motivated when we have chances to learn more about real world, real world skills and we're able to get our foot in the door with things like career technical education. It is time for a change and if I didn't believe that, I would not be sitting here right now endorsing it. I believe in student achievement, and this bill will accommodate student needs. We are the future, and we know what is essential in making our dreams a reality. And for some students, that starts in the classroom. As a current student in the public school system, I am thrilled that Tennessee wants to move forward with a student-based funding formula. Students are the most important factor of a public school system. And again, we're funding students, not systems. They must be put in front of any decision-making process, and with Tennessee investment in student achievement, I believe that this will be achieved. Thank you so much. Thank you for that, and I would hate to face you in a debate or a speech <laughs> contest. <laughs> Go right ahead. Or follow her in testimony, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, I'm Justin Owen with Beacon Impact. I also chaired the Fiscal Responsibility Subcommittee as part of this process, and I'm here today in support of TISA uh, primarily because it is a student-focused rather than systems-based approach to funding education, but also for three other reasons that I think are important to point out to the committee. One, the additional transparency for taxpayers and parents that this provides. By simplifying the formula, taxpayers and parents can better understand how much their child generates, why their child generates that funding, and on what that funding is spent. Districts, of course, are already required to report their per pupil expenditures, but we as an organization with a think tank with full-time staffers spend months in the years that we try to take that data and present it in a digestible way for taxpayers. This will now be at their fingertips like never before. And that increased transparency alone will lead to the next benefit of a student-based funding model, and that is accountability. By tying dollars spent to the outcomes that districts achieve, we can see what works and what doesn't, and we can fund things that get those results. In addition to that, the outcomes-based funding will provide further incentives for districts to be financially rewarded for making good decisions, for investing in the right ways, and getting results. And a third major benefit to a formula like this is it empowers school leaders with more flexibility. Beacon studied this issue and found that on average, a principal in this state only has say over about 8% of his or her budget. So imagine being the CEO of a company and being told, Here's your budget, 92% of it's already been allocated, good luck. 
We can't expect them to get results with their hands tied behind their backs like this. This will give them the ability to innovate and try new things and focus on funding what their needs are at the district and individual school level. We know that states are laboratories of democracy. This approach will allow schools and districts to be laboratories of education, and that's a good thing. So for these reasons, I urge you to vote for this bill and lead the way in moving to a student-based model that will cr create better transparency, accountability, and flexibility for our local leaders, and as a result, will lead to better outcomes for our kids. Thank you. Thank you. Members, do we have any questions for our guests? Chairman Sapicki. Um, th thank you. Let's, let's go on this side first for the Beacon Center here. Um, you've talked about accountability and goals and results. Do you know, what are they? What are the, the goals? Yes. Well, obviously, you've got certain benchmarks, like third grade reading is a huge benchmark. If you don't achieve that, then we know that that child right. is going to struggle uh, long term. Obviously, graduation rates are a big goal. Uh, getting kids prepared for either college or a technical path. So things like CTE are important for those kids who may not be a good fit for a four-year college, but can... Um, can, can get a great job in a trade in their local community, and then four-year college for those uh, who, are, who are a good fit for a four-year college. So I think those are key benchmarks. Uh, there are others, of course, throughout a, the, a student's career, but I think those are the big ones, and I think those are prioritized in, in this particular uh, proposal. Chairman Sapicki? So with the Beacon Center, I know the detail that you guys are all involved in right now. With the additional $1 billion of funding per year, um, let's say hypothetically in third grade, our literacy rates are 29%. In three years, what has the Beacon Center found with this additional funding with our students' outcomes? What's that new number going to be for Tennessee in three years? I don't have off the top of my head what that exact number is, uh, but I can report back to you what we've seen from other states. I'll be glad to, to get that number back to you, what we think would be a good benchmark from other states. And, and if you would send it to the whole committee, I'd appreciate oh, it. the chairman, I'd appreciate that. And then can I keep going, Mr. Chairman? Yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, you, young lady, you are well-spoken. I'm not even going to attempt to challenge oh. you. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, sorry about that. So, uh, on the, uh, the superintendent from Marshall County School, what's your last name, sir? Uh, Soros. Thank you, Mr. Soros. Um, you talk about the $6 million. Currently in Marshall County school system, are all of your positions funded by the BEP? No, sir, they're not. We got... We have 45 uh, certified positions that are uh, not funded within the BP. So if we, Mr. Chairman, so uh, stop me anytime you want, Mr. Chairman, okay? Thank you. So if we, if we, if you have six more million dollars coming and you've got 40 positions that aren't funded by the BP, are, are you saying at the local level you're going to hire 12 more people additional and still fund those 40 positions? Or are you going to fund those 40 positions with the 60 million or 6 million? We would fund those with the uh, ESSER. Uh, we're spending right at right around a million dollars on those 12 positions, a little under. Uh, we can pick all that up and we can add 12 more positions on top of that. So, so you both can, of those. With so the you can million. cover all, all your. Okay. Yes. But in the funding formula, isn't that money broken up into a weighted formula too? So if we have a student that has a, 10 learning disabilities, that they're getting 150 percent of that funding formula of that base ratio, isn't that money restricted to that student? It's a it's a funding formula, not a spending formula. So you could take the money that was allocated for a a, a student with a level 10 learning need and spend that elsewhere. Yes, you could. But I, I tell you what's going to happen with this. If it's as transparent as I think it's going to be, that's going to make for some hard conversations with some moms and dads if they know that. But you could. You could. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Clemens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How much money do you spend per student currently in Marshall County? Uh, roughly 5700 5700 Yes, sir. And is all of that BEP money? No, that's total. That's state and local. State and local? Yes, sir. No, I'm sorry. That is, that is BEP only. I apologize. And how many students do you have that would qualify as having unique learning needs under this legislation? I would say roughly seven, eight hundred. And so, how would you define the unique learning needs? 
uh, well, the state defines them for us, uh, one through 10. Uh, so when we have a, uh, an IEP uh, meeting, uh, the, the parents, the group, the team makes those decisions and there's different levels, whether it's level one, if I need extra time uh, to take a test or it's level 10 and I'm basically nonverbal um, and, and I need every need met for me all day long, everything that I do, that kid's gonna get, gonna be level 10, they're gonna be funded at 150%. Uh, so it's, that's on top of the base. Those kids get more because they need more. They have to have more spent on them to, so. Representative Clements. Thank you, and so if you had that much money allocated to that student and that student choose to go to a school in another county and your county lost those funds per student, would that create financial issues for you? Quite frankly, sir, uh, the other uh, school systems, the private schools aren't going to take that student. What about a charter school in a neighboring county? I can't speak for them. Um, Let's try to make sure we stay on, on, on the bill yeah. on this, though. Oh, you just, I, no answer. <laughs> That's fine. I don't think they'll want them either. I'll just be honest with you. Uh, you ask me a point blank question, I'll give you a point blank response. I, yeah. don't, I don't think they'll want those kids. Yeah, no, I appreciate because, it. Because those kids are, uh, that, that's a lot. It's basically, I'm talking about a nursing home style student. And so we're not making money off that kid. We're helping that kid. Exactly. Well, thank you for answering that question. And one more um, question. Go ahead, Reverend Clemens. And for Mr. Owens, Mr. Owens, you've repeatedly um, s said that rather than spend more money on education, school districts should focus on spending education funds more wisely. And yet you're here testifying today in favor of this spending bill or funding bill. Um, can you explain that? Happy to. So we've never said don't invest more in education. We said don't just invest more, spend more, and expect better results. This does spend more, obviously, but it comes with significantly increased transparency, significantly increased tra accountability, and gives the districts that flexibility to spend money in different ways uh, than they do now to get those results. And then we can see what works and what doesn't. So if we're going to spend a billion, we should not just throw more money into the BUP. We should overhaul the entire system so that we're getting the transparency, accountability, and flexibility that will lead to better results, whether we spend more or not. Representative Clemens. And do you think that there should be weights for economically disadvantaged students or poor communities? Of course, and we, we talked about that a lot on our uh, subcommittee and discussed you know, what those weights should be, how they should be broken down. Um, and our recommendations were taken by the department and incorporated into this, which was to include weights for economically disadvantaged, uh, for poverty, for students with special needs, English learners, and then essentially put those weights on a scale, knowing that not every child who meets one of those weights requires the same cost to fund, right? That some are more costly, some are, are less costly, and that's reflected in the proposal. Representative Love, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Commissioner, let me ask you this. Uh, what percent of your school funding does the state provide and do your local provide to your best knowledge? We have a $45 million budget. They provide about 30 million. Okay. And so you would probably need the state to keep providing at that same level. That would be nice. Yes, sir. We stand to get a 15% increase uh, if, if this passes. Okay. Uh, the reason I ask because I know across the state, one of the issues that we have is that Different counties have different percentages that the state contributes. There's this piece that the locals are supposed to provide. And so just want to always make sure that, that we get into that question and answer also about making sure that we have some, some, some understanding about the benefits of that. So it helps you that, that there's an opportunity for the state to come in and, and sure up what they have provided. Yes, sir, it does. And, and I understand uh, that there's going to be some districts that, that get more percentage wise than we do. And, and I'm okay with that. Um, I, I just, I think it's a, as long as it's a win for everybody, I, I think that's what's important because at the end of the day, it's a win for the kids. Yeah. So I, I'm not gonna get upset if one of my friends uh, in Murray County 
uh, gets more per kid than, than I do. Uh, you know, I'm not about that. I'm just, I, I want what's, I want a win sure. for everybody. Um, and I know that this can be a win for the students of Marshall County. Yeah. And there are some districts that pay more. Absolutely. And, and yes. so we always want to make sure that across the board that kids, of course, to your point, do uh, get the education that they need. Yes, sir. Thank you for your answers. Yes, sir. Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and to the young lady, thank you for being here, uh, as my colleague noted, well-spoken. But my question for you is, is straightforward, and that is, as a student, you're looking with a perspective of one inside the fishbowl, so to speak, uh, but you're getting near the end. I if am. you look back uh, at, at your career through there, where do you see that a formula like this, which increases funding on the basis of needs and or other requirements, would have helped you or those that you know personally? One of my biggest regrets was not taking a marketing class because at my school, if you take a marketing class, you can be in DECA. And I'm an FBLA, but I wish that my freshman year, someone would have told me that I could have chosen more than one career path because I feel like students get pressured to choose a certain career path. And as freshmen, that... <laughs> That is a lot of pressure to, to know exactly what you want to do. And so that was really hard for me. I chose business just because my brother chose business, and I wish I had reevaluated. But I think that career technical education and CTSOs, I think that students shouldn't feel so pressured to choose a certain one their freshman year and stick to that all four years of high school. Chairman Reagan. Follow up to that, do you think this change in the funding formula would have changed that? Absolutely. I know that in my subcommittee, we advocated really hard for that, and we are getting more funding toward CTE, and so I think students will have more options, definitely. Thank you, Chairman Reagan. Thank you. A question for Mr. Owen. Uh, by the way, your organization does great work. I respect the uh, stuff that you put out. It's, it's quite informative for us. The question, though, is, you mentioned results, performance. And so this funding formula uh, is not a spending formula. We've got that on the table. But if we put out enough funding for additional school nurses, additional SROs, additional uh, counselors, and so forth and so on, uh, what increment of improvement there can we see in student outcomes? If we fund the, the number of SROs uh, that are recommended or the number of school nurses that are recommended, What's to say that the system is going to spend it on that? And if they do, how is that going to increase student performance incrementally? So uh, going back to Representative Sapiki's question, we can get you numbers on what other states have seen with relatively similar investments, and we'll be glad to provide those to the, the committee. I think two benefits are the first thing is to draw the line between those two, right, between the spending and whatever benchmark you set, whether it's third grade reading, graduation rates, those types of things, so that taxpayers and parents can see the results of that. Right now, it's difficult to know how those funds are being spent because the way it's being tracked and the or the, how complex the BUP is. If we know we're spending X on school nurses, X on these specific things to get these results over here, you can really just see that on a dashboard, which you can't now to evaluate, even as legislators on the back end. And of course, that's going to grow over time. If we get a 5% increase in, say, third grade reading proficiency in a year, well, you don't want to just say our, our cap is that 5% increase. It should continue to grow over time with additional investments. And so I think you have to ask what's the short-term gain plus what's the long-term gain over the course of years as this is implemented. But I think the big benefit is to see the line between the spending and the results and benchmarks that you've set and may change over time as policymakers. But as far as what we've seen in other states, like I said, I, I can get that for the, for the committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Chairman Watt. Thank you, Chairman. Let's see if I can express my question where it can be answered to Mr. Mr. Soros. Maybe you can help me. It seems the way I see this formula that we're looking at now under TISA that it gives the locals extreme flexibility, but there is more accountability. 
because we see where the dollars are going. You're getting dollars based on student weights and where those dollars are going. And if you're not moving the needle, whether it be, uh, you know, unique learning needs student or um, third grade reading or whatnot, we see that you're getting the X amount of dollars, but yet you're not moving it. Would, it, would that be a true statement? I would call it transparency. I think we already have the accountability uh, with, our, with all our state testing. Uh, so I would say there's more transparency. But yes, it's still, um, and even in their, um, you know, the direct funding, K3 literacy, they're not telling us, you know, there's, there's not a mandate, but they're really putting it in here, really, hey, uh, you're getting K3 uh, literacy $500 per kid. Don't you think you should push that down there? I mean, they're, they're kind of telling us in some way, CTE, $5,000 per kid, fourth grade tutoring, uh, post-secondary assessments, that's, that's all direct funding. That's all uh, post-secondary assessments, ACT. Um, I don't know if I answered your question or not. <laughs> Chairman Watt. Uh, no, you did. I'm just making sure I'm asking it correctly. Well, it looks like to me, though, I, li I like the word transparency. I, I, I agree with you on that. But it seems like where we've been, I've been on education for nine years, and it seems like all the accountability comes from our testing. The only way we know if you're doing adequately in, in uh, Marshall County, by we constantly test. Correct. And therefore, we hold you accountable. Now, as Mr. Wilson says, we have accountability through funding. Is that it's fair? It's still, the way I understand it, it's still a funding formula, not a spending formula. So technically, we generate X number of funds for all these different purposes, but unless it's codified in law, right, we can still spend it the way we want to. Um, now, I want to spend it the way it needs to be spent, but that's gonna be different in every district based off of what your needs are. Uh, the, the needs in Williamson County are gonna be different from the needs in Wayne County or Marshall County. And that's the whole point. Yes. We know we know your needs of the students there, so therefore we know the funding you're getting based upon your needs. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just one quick follow-up to that point uh, before I go to Chairman Sapicki. Um, one of the things that we hear about the BEP a lot is is it kind of has a, a more of a cookie cutter approach. And and I guess the question I have is is going this route over a period of time, are we going to be able to see some areas that are seeing very high success rates and be able to like learn is like, well, we can model this behavior, we can recommend this behavior because look at the reading scores over here, what are y'all doing? Well, we put our money here. And is that is that something that's possible in this that's not currently possible? I'll be glad to take first stab at that, Mr. Chairman. Absolutely, I think the, bit, the biggest benefit is just that. With the flexibility, different districts are gonna prioritize different things and that's okay. A, because their, their student population looks different. But when we do start to see something really click and work in terms of like getting a really good return on that investment, then other districts can follow that. Just like when a state does something really well from a policy standpoint, other states can adopt that and improve upon it. And so I think that one of the biggest benefits is to let districts try different things and see what works. And then the review process is part of this for those schools that aren't doing well. That committee will bring them in and have those discussions about how they're spending relative to those districts that are spending and getting better outcomes. So I think you're just gonna have a lot more data at your fingertips to know what works and what doesn't by letting them test those things. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Sapicki. So, so to follow up on, on the whole line of questioning here, is the state of Tennessee is making a huge investment with our children. And with that comes accountability of the transparency of how you spend it, but also the people of Tennessee, we know we can't be where we are in education right now on literacy rates, on math rates, on ACT scores. Giving the flexibility to the LEAs to make these, these decisions at the local level the accountability is going to come when we're not, the biggest fear I have is that in three years we're right, right where we are. We've been right where we are now for a long time. We're stuck. And what, I'm, what our fear is, and I speak for some members, not all the members, but what our fear is, is we make this capital investment in education across the state of Tennessee, giving local autonomy to do basically whatever you want to do with the money, 
as long as you can be accountable to the state on it, answering to your school board, because your school board's gonna weigh in on these decisions too and what they wanna spend it on. And the biggest fear is we're three years from now and we're sitting at a literacy rate of 28% in third grade. With the 4.2 billion from ESSER invested, and now for three years, close to $27 billion invested in education. Is there anything, where do you see Marshall County in three years, literacy rate wise? I, I get the feeling that you think uh, all the laws that y'all pass, y'all pass a lot of them, uh, <laughs> don't matter. They do. Mm -hmm. uh, we spend a lot of time digging through them and then you'll go change it. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have to go dig through it again. Uh, but um, we, what you do matters. Okay, the, the literacy law last year, that's your accountability. You're really just paying for it now. You're just giving us the tools to carry it out. There's so much accountability that, that, that y'all give to us. It, that, that was, that's huge. That's a, there's tons of repercussions for that. We talk about it all the time. We just need the money to implement, implement it. And, you know, I know you played ball, right? <laughs> no. What coach ever gave a guarantee that we're going to win this or win that? right? We want to win. We want to be the best. I promise we do. But you're just not going to get, you're not going to get those guarantees. You can set out in, in law. You've got to do these things, which you've done. And that stuff matters. Give us the money to carry it out. And, and if we don't, then that's on us. Then we allocated it wrong. My fault. Get rid of me. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Representative Love. Thank you. And, and I appreciate what you're saying. Uh, we do pass a lot of laws. <laughs> and then we pass them to change them the next year. Uh, I appreciate all of you all being here. And this will be to everybody. What could be better? If you had the time. Uh, and if, it's, if, it's, if you can't answer it now, email us, but think about it. What could be better uh, based upon your three unique experiences uh, if, if, you could, if you could, if you could do it? I, I, I don't make the formula win for all districts. I, I know that there were some small school districts, a couple of them uh, in my area. Um, it just costs more. The, 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 the economies of scale or lack thereof for those guys it isn't favorable. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, we added in, um, well, I guess when we add in the, the Tisser, I mean the Sieber and the, the other formula that will, Tasser, that will help. Uh, I, I think those, some of those small school systems are really struggling, and that would be my first reaction to, to, to make it better. I think it should be a win for everybody. Nobody should not get uh, something out of this. I think it's wrong. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for our guests? Well, Chairman, I had. Oh, oh go, ahead. Had, no, that was, love, go ahead. It was for all three. If, uh, well, they also had a homework assignment right there, so I didn't know yeah. they, they They can choose the homework assignment. I right. gave them the option, and she looked like she was about to okay. do her <laughs> work in, in school before taking it home, all right. I, I think, probably. I think I've been in elementary school the most recent, I would assume so, I've been. <laughs> I, so I was in elementary school most recently. And one thing that our subcommittee discussed, speaking for specific students, students with dyslexia, I know that I experienced in elementary school being around some of those students, and even in middle school, those students with dyslexia sometimes feel like they're not appreciated because they're put into these classrooms and teachers have a certain speed to go at and maybe the kids with dyslexia are falling behind and they don't want to speak up. I know this has happened to me personally with students around me, my peers, and I think that they don't want to speak up because they're scared that the teacher might get onto them just logically thinking about an elementary school student. So I think that having more teachers to accommodate their needs, and then also in addition to students with dyslexia, I think about ESL learners. When I was in the fifth grade, I had a student who came to my class and she spoke no English at all. And you couldn't help but feel bad for her. And then 
also in the student engagement subcommittee, we had a girl say that she's in a class right now as a junior in high school with a student in her Spanish class who speaks no English. So the teacher is kind of having to teach two different lessons to um, the kids who do speak English and the, and the singular student who doesn't. So I think that um, just having more individuals to accommodate those needs for not just dyslexia and ESL, but those are the two that I've been exposed to primarily. Thank you. Thank you, Representative, Mr. Chairman. Uh, f for us, I think there's future opportunity for more outcomes funding as we see what works. So it's not really a criticism of the current proposal as much as going back to what the chairman was saying, if we see what works, start to incentivize that through that outcomes um, bucket at the top so that we're continuing to get those results and can encourage, not require, but encourage uh, other districts to, to follow the good lead of, of those that are getting results. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the levity on that. Chairman Watt. This is a quick comment. Ms. Brown, I don't know what your career goes all are, but please stay in Tennessee, okay? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> we could use you. <laughs> Any other questions for our guests? Seeing none, thank you guys for joining us. Um, we will bring up um, the administration and uh, the department now. Uh, they'll come up and uh, just state their names and who they represent for the record, and we'll open it up for any comments that they have to open up with, and then uh, if we have any questions, we'll open it up for questions. Go ahead, just for the record, go ahead and just state your names and who you represent. Uh, Penny Schwinn, Commissioner of Education, Great State of Tennessee. Brent Easley, Legislative Director for Governor Lee. Sam Piercy, Deputy Commissioner. And if you have any open comments, you're welcome to, or we can go right into some questions, however you would like to proceed. We are um, happy to, to answer any questions that you have. I just want to say a thank you to those who spoke today. Um, really appreciate their comments. Members, we have any questions for our guests? I'm sure we do. Representative Clemens, you're batting lead off. It's dangerous. So I keep hearing that this is more transparent and, and, and a simpler than the BEP, but the bulk of this bill is contingent upon future appropriations. It has a four-year cliff, and it is contingent upon administrative rulemaking. Most of the details that have been touted about this piece of legislation are not in the legislation. They are contingent upon a unilateral decision of the Commissioner of Education and the State Board of Education providing a recommendation on that decision and administrative rulemaking. So how is this more transparent? This process is transparent. Legislation, legislating is transparent. Administrative rulemaking, not so much. The bulk of this bill is administrative rulemaking. How is this more transparent than the BEP? So a couple of things. So I think one, I just want to be very clear that there is not a four-year fiscal cliff. We are happy to walk through that in detail, but that is not that is not actually that is not an accurate statement. I think on the rulemaking piece, the decisions that are part of that the rulemaking that happens within the department, those are things that we make decisions on now. It is just there is no rulemaking on it. There are a lot of decisions that are made with administering the BEP that are done internal to the department that are not public at all. We introduce that into rulemaking as a way to make that public. And part of that rulemaking process includes a public hearing. It will also include the state board giving a positive, neutral, or negative recommendation through the amendment. And then finally, it goes to the Government Operations Committee. Those are all different layers of accountability and transparency that, again, do not exist within the BEP as it is currently run. Representative Clements. So in one of the latest amendments, y'all tried to address the questions of this committee by outlining the base funding amount or base amount. And I still would like to know how $6,860 per student as a base amount is going to cover all those things that you're claiming to cover in that amount. And also, 6860 as a base amount seems very odd and continuing to underfund education when 
this governor valued each student in his ESA legislation at $7,300 per student. So how do you balance those two totals? And how is 6860 going to pay for everything you've outlined in these recitals? So I want to make clear that that is the base is one part of the full funding formula. So if we are looking at the $7,300, that's including the entirety of the BEP. When you are looking at the base amount, which again is the second highest in the Southeast, and it is the 12th highest in the country, we actually provided a one pager that worked through the fiscal year 23 actual BEP numbers and show dollar for dollar how that compares against TISA. When you look at that, what you see is that there's $125 million more dollars allocated to the base under TISA than what would have been spent in those categories in the BEP. And we actually walk through that math in a, in a one-page document. So walk us through it now. How okay. does, let's, let's hear how that's configured. Sure. So um, there are uh, three, essentially there are four components. We shrunk that into three. So on the instructional component, it is $3.59 billion dollars. You have the classroom component, which is $690 million. And then you have the non-classroom component, which is $2.17 billion. Altogether, the projected allocations for the BEP for fiscal year 23, including coordinated school health, plus school safety, plus family resource center. So all of those together equals $7.749 billion. There is $1.056 billion that has been um, moved to the weights. And then $197 million, which is currently in the direct uh, 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 part of the formula. So when you just look at what is remainer, remaining, it is $6.495 billion. That is what is in the BEP and all of the grants that I just mentioned. For TISA, the base amount only is $6.6 .6 billion for a difference uh, of $125.79 million. Now, when you look at the weights, which again, this is all together uh, combined, for the weights under the BEP, it is $1.056 billion. Under TISA, the weights are $1.767 billion. For the direct funding component, under the BEP, those same line items are $197 million. Under TISA, it's $375 million. There are $0 allocated in the BEP for outcomes. There are $80 million allocated in TISA, plus funds that are typically reverted. Representative Clemens. Thank you. And so one of the recitals is to provide equitable funding for students, and we obviously have that required by the state constitution mm -hmm. and case law in Tennessee, specifically the McWhorter case. So we just heard from a gentleman from Marshall County. Marshall County is going to get $6 million additional dollars. Davidson County, the entire county, is going to get $12 million additional dollars. Explain that. So those, that's a, just to be clear, that's a little bit of an apples to oranges comparison. When Marshall County, that is how much the students are generating, right? On Davidson County, you are only putting apart what the state is contributing. The formula actually contributes approximately 42 or $44 million for Davidson County. The concern that I know I've heard, I've heard from you, um, which I, I can appreciate and understand, is fiscal capacity. That is the difference that in terms of how much comes from the state versus how much the locals have to put in. That is something that is required for us to apply. I think the amendment would allow for the tasser seber average as, as has been occurring in, under the BEP. But either way, Davidson County does have a significantly larger fiscal capacity than, than Marshall County. And so that is, I think that's what you're referencing. I just want to be clear that Marshall County, that's the total dollar figures versus Davidson County, that 12 million is the additional state dollars. The other thing I just want to make sure to clarify is that Davidson County, part of the challenge was they were receiving over $55 million to pay for a decline in economically disadvantaged students. So we were paying the district 50 to $55 million because they had seen a decrease of about 10,000 students who were economically disadvantaged. We were paying for that difference from 2016 onward. So that's part of what this calculation includes. There One more follow-up, and we'll go to the next. Go ahead, Resident Clements. Okay, well, we got a lot of questions here. So with the fiscal capacity issue, we don't know, are you counting state property, state-owned buildings? What are you counting in the fiscal capacity? We don't even know if that's included. The definition of economically disadvantaged, you're using Title I schools. Don't you think that undercounts students? Um, would cover kids or something like that not be a better reflection of the total economically disadvantaged or um, students. Um, I mean, I've got so many questions. I'll just leave it at that. 
Do you, would you like me to answer I'll those? I'll definitely come back to you. I just had some other people come on the list. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. So for, for fiscal capacity, it's the same calculations that districts have experienced under the BEP. So one is TASSER and one is CBER. The average of those is what currently exists under the BEP. With the amendment, there would be no change. So it would be the status quo of what happens now is, is that's the fiscal capacity calculation. Two completely different calculations. We did see, um, I'm happy to, to send uh, back over the document that goes through and outlines that. We have one produced by the department. There's also an external one that I think is really helpful as well. So no change in the fiscal capacity. In terms of Title I and economically disadvantaged, I want to highlight that there are two calculations right now. There is your economically disadvantaged, and that is actually not the Title I eligible schools. That is looking specifically at those who are directly certified, um, foster, homeless, runaway, and migrant. That is how we calculate at risk now. It is a slightly broader definition, but it is the same calculation. For economically disadvantaged, when we look at concentration of poverty, we actually don't have that calculation in the BEP. That is an additional um, component and an allocation that would be given to districts. The number of students who are in Title I eligible schools is actually commensurate with the last time that the state did any kind of free and reduced price meal form um, collection. That was in 2016. The proportional um, component of those numbers is the Title I eligible students is proportionally the same as when we as when we uh, collected those FRPM forms. So that is that is an equivalent number. But free and reduced lunch is drastically undercounted. I mean, there are a lot of students who qualify for that who do not apply. For do you free think that's an adequate re reflection for of free the actual? Yeah. Um, I, I apologize, sir. No, no. That, I mean, for free problem. and reduced lunch. So you're yeah. saying that that goes into that factor. So that is a drastically undercounted, I would argue, number. I know that a lot of families don't apply for that for various reasons. That's correct. And when the General Assembly moved away from that in 2016 to the direct cert, I think what we have done is we have said there are two factors. So one, when you look at FRPM, there are two issues that I would identify and I would agree with you. Um, we see that there is a higher rate of participation in form completion in elementary school that tends to decline a bit in middle school and then decline quite significantly in high school, which, which I think aligns with a lot of other things. Um, the second issue is that when you assign additional funding for free and reduced price meals based on that form, the additional funding, there is a very different type of audit that happens. What we've seen is that nationally, it's a 5 to 8%, 6 to 8% error rate. That is a really high error rate that then has to get rectified at the end of the year. Those are both reasons why we know that so many states have moved away from FRPM. Now, we also know that some districts will continue to collect those forms, and that can be used as part of Title I eligibility. Um, for Title I eligible schools, the big difference that I just want to note is that a Title I school is of all the schools that qualify in a district, districts actually have to pick the ones that they want to receive the funding. Not every school within the district who is eligible actually gets the designation or that funding. So this does ensure that those students who attend those schools receive additional funding um, for the needs of that particular school in a way that is, I think, more inclusive than just sticking to Title I designation only. So I think that is a more inclusive definition. Representative Clemens, do you have a follow-up directly to that one? or? We'll come back to it. Uh, Chairman Sapicki, you're recognized. Um, a couple, <laughs> lots of questions today. Yes, sir. Um, there was a statement made about the $5,000 for CTE, mm -hmm. that that's what they're receiving. Can you just make sure we clarify that? Because from what I understand from the department, that's based off of what level of CTE course they take. So we just plugged $5,000 in there as an average. That doesn't mean that they're going to get $5,000 per student. We're just hoping that the, that that would be an average. It could be less than that or maybe more, but you never know. But it, depending on what level of student is taking in a one, two, three, or four, the funding would be a we would be matched with that. Is that a correct statement? That, that's correct. Right now we fund CTE courses at about four, I mean, with all the CTE components in the BEP, it's about $4,500 per student. This brings that average up 500, but it would, ha it would have a range depending on how far in the sequence they were. But it does also include, I think, um, really good feedback that I remember uh, you provided in the summer was the idea of middle school and wanting to ensure that we were able to address some of those needs going into high school. So it does account for that as well, sir. Chairman Sapicki. And then when we get the big, the big question I keep getting from across the state is teachers, right? Yes, sir. That the locals spend more money on teachers than the BEP funded, and we're trying to address that with flexibility. There is more money, but there is greater flexibility of how they spend that money. And with that being said, 
there's really not much in the bill that directs the LEAs on how to spend the money. It's pretty much autonomy to their end to begin with. So far, correct? Yes, sir. So there is flexibility that allows a superintendent or a school board to take money that could be allocated towards education of a student and spend it differently than what could be intended from the state. So far, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, and then as we come in on the back end and look at, at scores, then there could be the accountability coming in on the back end is, well, your scores haven't improved and you're spending your money the, this way, then there could be corrective action taken after that, in theory. Correct? Yes, sir. I think um, how I would how I would characterize it if I'm, I'm channeling um, in this moment my daughter, which is maybe not the best example, but it's it's kind of saying I will give you the funding to um, go buy whatever ingredients you need to bake a cake. You decide what ingredients they are. You bake the cake. You decorate the cake. I'm going to come in on the other end and, and and judge all the cakes. You know, in terms of how how good they taste or how how well they're decorated. I do have to say I think part of this and, and to your point on autonomy. I deeply believe in the work that's happening in our districts, and I deeply believe that the superintendents in our state will make the best decisions for kids. And part of what you are hearing um, from me in terms of that that confidence in the autonomy is, is really driven by the people who are in our school systems. And I do believe every day they will learn from what worked and what didn't work, but it is based in that deep-rooted belief that locals will make good decisions on behalf of their kids, because those are the kids they see every day in a way that I, I certainly wouldn't in Nashville. Chairman Sapiki. Thank you. Now, uh, let's shift gears a little bit about teachers, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So there's nothing in the allocation, there's nothing in the TISA formula that states that a teacher has to be in the base amount. It, um, could, it yeah. could be in a unique learning need, salary, or it could be in the CTE line. So there is flexibility for them to assign those teachers to different places. Yes, that's correct. I think the place where you would see anything related to requirements on educators would happen in programmatic components of the statute, but it does not say where in the formula those teachers have to be funded from. That's correct, sir. So if there's a teacher in a unique learning need or in CTE and we give a pay raise to the baseline, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to have enough money to pay for that teacher that's in a unique learning line or a CTE to be able to get them the same pay raise as everybody else. If they if they so choose to move those teachers around, so I so what I would say is when you increase, let's say the base a um, hundred million dollars or one hundred twenty five million dollars, that will filter through the weight. So you'll get that increase for teacher salaries um, assigned to the base, and then on the weights, you will see that weighted difference increase. So if you have teachers funded from that, that increase could be used for um, salary increases there as well. I would also say that typically when we, um, as a state, have been budgeting on teacher increases for those BEP funded positions, what we've started to model out is what that looks like when you put it into the base. I know that was a question um, from both, both of you, Chairman, and, and a couple others, um, what that ends up being when it trickles through the formula and what that ends up producing. So I do think it does cover those teacher raises. That's something that we've been um, kind of very cognizant of. The only thing I would, I would want to be clear on is that it does not direct districts on how they allocate those increases. Our districts have different salary schedules. Some have performance plans and other things. We would want to make sure they had the flexibility to do those increases in the way that makes the most sense locally. Let, Chairman Zapiggy. Thank you. And last one for now yes, sir. is I've gone through uh, 15591. And in 15591, I believe right now, there is no funding in the bill for outcomes. We, we, we would have to, that would be additional on top of, to, to provide the outcomes bonuses for the LEAs. Mm -hmm. So we, that has to be allocated on top of this. And, I, and that's okay, I, I understand, that's fine. But the one thing I'd like to see and what we'll probably see is a mechanism that would reward teachers for excellent performance also. So some type of mechanism in the language because we always up here, we always revert back to the language in the law if we put something in here that says, if we have teachers hitting their benchmarks for our students, that there's a way to get them a direct bonus from the state. So if an LEA isn't performing at the highest levels, teachers that are could still gain a financial benefit from that. So that's something we'll probably be working on later. I'll, I got more I'll pass off right now. Thank Cha you, sir. Chairman Watt. Thank you, 
Thank you, Chairman. Commissioner, one concern I have, and, and I, I appreciate that the, the administration and DOE has listened to the concerns over the past two weeks, and we're adding these amendments, which I don't disagree with. But I do have a question. As someone who does support the option of charter schools, because I believe that they're, they're needed in certain areas, certain LEAs, and for certain students that, that, that need these, it's a parental choice where there may not be an option for a parent. We did remove the public charter schools from the weighted funding, and we'll go, go back to the direct funding we're doing now. So what I would like to ask, what is the uh, guarantee moving forward? Because there are issues that we've addressed continually, facilities and things. So what exactly going forward will we be doing in addressing the direct funding allocations for our charters? Yes, sir. So I, I want to um, make sure that I acknowledge kind of the rationale and I, I want to also say I appreciate the feedback from, from folks in this room and very candidly from superintendents in these conversations related to the weight is shared across districts. It's that 70-30 split. And when we look at if there was ever a need to reduce in the formula, the weights are the last to come. So I think those were two kind of compelling arguments in, in that conversation that I think were important to consider. Um, in terms of how that would work moving forward, when you look at that charter school funding, as we know, it's outside of the BEP now. Um, and so it kind of is, is in the appropriations bill. Some folks knew about it, some folks didn't. Um, what this would do is it would still work through appropriations. So every year it becomes a recurring amount and that is built into the base of the budget. Um, just like it is now. The difference is from a transparency perspective, I think to the point that Representative Clemens brought up, this would now say it is in the formula, in direct funding, everyone can see it. It's not kind of kind of hidden away in, 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 a, in a large budget book. So there is that transparency about it is in the formula, but it is a recurring funding um, through the appropriations bill every year. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Representative Clemens, did you wanna come back? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, and please feel free to let anybody else jump in if they need to. So in, in the first time you prepared for this committee, you were, I've got the transcript of your testimony up here somewhere, you really were excited about us eliminating TASSER from that fiscal capacity mm -hmm. calculation. Mm -hmm. Now it's back in. So are you glad it's back in as part of the formula or because you seem very glad that it was out last time you were here? <laughs> Yes, so I mean, I, I think it's it's both and. I think part of what I also believe I testified on or at least have spoken with people about is fiscal capacity has to be applied one way or another. That is a requirement. We have said on a couple of occasions the department's pretty deferential in terms of which calculations you all want to use. I think with CBER, we talked about the three reasons why we included that in the initial proposal. The first was we heard a lot of stakeholder feedback saying that we should have one calculation, not an average of two. We also um, saw some legislative intent from several years ago to move to CBER. And third, we looked at best practice and what is happening in, in states across the country. And what we saw is they'd moved to a more CBER-like formula, which is the simple calculation. So we tried to make that objective decision, looking at all of those things together. It, it does, I mean, the amendment does reflect that the feedback we heard is to go back to that average. And like I said, it doesn't change the formula in terms of how much is produced for students. It is really about what that local share breaks up in terms of local contributions. So that, I, I think both of those, um, both of those truths can exist. Representative Clemens. So with regards to capital needs of LEAs, how is mm -hmm. that addressed in this? Um, because I know um, several LEAs, you know, said that they would ideally need X amount of dollars to address. And, you know, aside from fast growth stipends, which aren't necessarily going to apply to every county that have capital needs, how are those going to be addressed fully under this formula? So um, I think first and foremost, in terms of what was previously funded under the BEP, that funding still carries over into this formula. I think the second thing I would say is that with any additional funding, to, to the chairman's point earlier, um, there is a lot of flexibility. So how districts choose to spend their dollars is really some of that local decision making. But there is a minimum of what was previously funded does carry over into TISA. Representative Clements, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so it's carrying over into TISA, so it's not changing. But now if you're waiting or you're giving direct allocations to charter schools, you're waiting certain things, and if that money leaves the public school system, they're still going to have those capital needs. So how is that addressed specifically? And is that circumstance even considered in the formula? 
th there is no difference by in funding formulas. If a student leaves a district, whether that is a, a resource-based, a categorical, or a student-based formula, the student is no longer in the school system, so this, the school system does not receive funding. In a resource-based formula, that's gonna happen in aggregates and averages. In a student-based formula, you can see that at the student level, but there isn't, there isn't a scenario where the district keeps receiving funding for that student. The only exceptions I would say are under the safety net that currently exists in the BEP that ends up being, I think, $70 million or something every year that we give for loss for students who have left. Irvin Clemens, one more, and then I'm gonna go uh, to uh, uh, Representative Love. Okay. Um, well, there's no cost of living adjustment um, that I see in this. Um, you've got different needs in different counties, different costs. Teachers face different costs depending on where they live and which county they work. They may travel from one county to another. How come there are no cost of living adjustments or factors in this formula? Um, and I'm piggybacking that. Were there any other weights considered by the administration that were not included in the formula? I haven't been asked that before. Um, so on the on the cost of living adjustment, um, we did a, a lot of uh, consideration of what happens in other states. There's a lot of variance, frankly, in what happens there. Um, we had also seen that some of the, we have a similar measure that's currently in the BEP. There's been a, a move to lower that year over year. That's part of, I think, legislation that, that happened a little while ago. So we were again looking at that trend. I think we have seen um, two or three districts, um, but I will acknowledge, uh, you know, for Metro Nashville, I know, I know that's where you represent, that is a, a significant factor in terms of the feedback we've heard from them, and I want to acknowledge and validate that, that we did hear that feedback. I know we've had lots of conversations on it. Um, in terms of other weights that were considered in the formula, there was a, an initial conversation um, specifically around that K through three literacy weight or an elementary school weight. Um, we did hear that quite a bit from the subcommittees. Uh, one of the things that we heard from just a cost control perspective was that it made more sense to put in direct because that allowed us to control for the local, the local uh, share of the formula. So that's why you see that $500 per student in the direct. The same thing with CTE. We did hear that some folks wanted to see that more as a weight as opposed to direct. But again, we wanted to make sure that we could control for those local increases and keep that bill, again, set that lower than where it is now. And so both of those ended up moving from weights into the direct funding component. Mr. Chairman, if I may just Absolutely. make a point. I was going to ask if you want to follow up on that. Yeah, so I appreciate that. And so I, I don't just ask that cost of living question for Davidson County. I mean, that's a huge factor for Davidson County. But Haywood County... Tipton and Fayette are about to see incredible cost of living increases over the next few years. Williamson County seeing them. Rutherford, Columbia, Murray County. Uh, these, this isn't a, just a Davidson County issue. Cost of living is a significant issue for anybody in the donut counties around Nashville, the greater Nashville region. I want to make that clear. That's not just about Nashville. Uh, unfortunately, most teachers can't afford to live in Nashville already because we underfund education so badly. But I, I just want to make that clear, Mr. Chairman, and please come back to me if you get a chance. Representative Love. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioner. Thank you for being here. Yes, sir. Of course, one of my concerns is about local share, state share of the funding. My numbers may be a bit off, uh, but I think Nashville is somewhere in the 60 to 63 percent range for its contribution to the education of the students which puts the state at around 37, 36%, which is, of course, different from other districts. <laughs> and we all know that everyone will not have the same situation. Uh, as a previous guest noted, some districts get a larger percent, some get a smaller percent. But I think also the numbers are correct Nashville's contribution toward the 30% local share is around 17%, 17.66, somewhere there about. Yes, sir. So the, the fiscal capacity under CBER 17.99, TASR 17.39, and the weighted, the average is the 17.69%, okay. sir. So here's my dilemma. Yes, sir. As Nashville continues to grow, mm -hmm. my concern is that as we 
continue to increase in fiscal capacity, the percent of the state contribution will diminish, all while the expectation of Nashua to contribute to that local fiscal capacity share will increase, which then puts an extra burden on Nashville tax payers or profit owners because the, the main way to increase revenues is to raise property taxes. And so my concern is, is there any way to uh, establish a floor whereby uh, at a minimum, each county could expect 50% from the state. As my colleague has pointed out, there'll be some change across the state. Uh, in the western part of our state, when a car manufacturer builds a plant and that property value goes up, you may find that fiscal capacity also increasing and then a dramatic shift may occur where then that county that had not been at a level of fiscal capacity in a number of years now has a different level. So it is about Nashville for me, but I'm also looking toward my other colleagues to say, and I have an amendment, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna not try to tag it on in the hopes that we can do some work with it that would require 50% minimum uh, contribution from the state uh, to every school district. Uh, Section E talks about the intent of the General Assembly is to provide funding on a fair and equitable basis by recognizing the differences in the ability of local jurisdictions to raise local revenues. And I know that in, in, the, in the balancing of a budget, we all got to talk about what can be raised. And sometimes what happens in consideration, uh, you use the example of a, making a cake. Uh, I use an example of just, we can't assume what someone's ability to raise funds can be simply because we say, well, the city's growing. Can't you give? Right, and so just want to put that out there that maybe some consideration can be given to, to, consider, to look at what it would be like. I know it would cause some issues because you'd have to recalculate everything, but what would that be like? Because you have other sections, not you, but then the bill and the amendment, the other sections where it says that uh, the state shall provide a grant for this kind of county. The state can provide a grant for this kind of county. Uh, if they have a tourism district, if they have this, if they have that. And so as we start talking about language and, and, and how to put it in, and just, just give consideration uh, to that piece about how one might uh, try to uh, get to a place where the cliff is not such that the state's 37% becomes 34, 30, 20. 10, 5, and Nashville's contribution is 17, 18, 19, 20, and, and then we have difficulty. So thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Vice Chairman Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to start by uh, saying thank you for the, the, you know, the concern we're hearing here about the, the locals and what the effect we'll see there. Um, and that's been one of my greatest concerns from the beginning because of my district and the changes we're going to see over the next three to five to seven uh, years. So, uh, you know, I know what I'm saying on paper looks good, but I also know reality. And, and you know, I just want, I, I definitely appreciate the questions on that because we, we don't want to see any drastic increase. And, and honestly, what I've seen from some other states, we're seeing that concern raised and seeing that in reality there. So that is on my radar. But for this round of questioning, I want to focus on, I'm going to tread on the, chairman's territory a little bit and uh, shift gears to coordinated school health. I had a, uh, a good meeting in my district with, with some folks yesterday and they had some concerns and I just wanted to get some clarity today. So previously coordinated school health was, was funded through grants, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And, and now what we're looking at is it's going to be 
included in the base. Is this correct? The funding, the funding would work that way. The, the programmatic components of coordinated school health are, are dealt with separately in a different part of the statute. The, the sh there is a shift in language that I think I, I saw the same, same uh, document that you probably saw and, and happy to chat through that too. Well, that's going to be my next question was yes, the sir. amendment kind of the changes we made. Would you clarify that on, on what it says, where we are now? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so in the the same funding is included in the base. There would still be the requirements under that under the coordinated school health, the programmatic component within the statute. I think um, in in reading through the the concern in terms of the language shift, it was to kind of keep with the same bill, and and you have to spend the funding on coordinated school health. In the current statute, what it says is, and there must be someone designated to oversee. It doesn't technically require a full-time person, but that is the practice that is used in most of our districts, and I think a really good and important one. Um, I understand, and, and can, I can understand absolutely the concern that, that that clause is not seen in the bill, and, and certainly want to be able, we'll, we will be deferential to, to whatever um, change you would want to make there. It was not the intent of the department to see any programmatic changes there. It was actually the intent to ensure that coordinated school health was funded in every district. District. It is not currently funded in every district, and we think it's a really important service that happens within our school districts. Okay, th hurt. I'm sorry. Thank you um, for that, and we'll have a little more discussion moving forward to make sure we're, we're all on the same page there. But yes, sir. Um, I guess the last question that they expressed some concern now that it's not a grant, mm -hmm. and we still have some funding. I mean, some uh, reporting, and I, they, you know, we, we, we're hearing that. When when they received grants, the reporting you know, it was a lot of reporting, basically because it was a grant, and they t everybody totally understood that. How does the reporting from the grants now going to compare to the reporting they're required to do that it's figured in and it's it's, a, it's basically funded a different way? How does that compare? Yeah, so I think one of the things we would expect to see, and, and similar to what we are seeing with a lot of the components moving to a student-based formula, is that we're able to streamline some of those bureaucratic elements that take up lots of hours in school systems with folks who just want to get to kids and give kids services. So I think if you're going to see a change, it would actually be a streamline in those reporting because we don't have to go into ePlan and fill out a whole grant application for every single thing. The funding is there. It is really about ensuring that our coordinated school health professionals in all of our districts are able to focus on those really critical services for students, I think that's actually a, a significant benefit to this. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very optimistic about what that means for kids and that those hours spent filling out grant applications and the hours we spend reviewing them and approving them, um, those can all be redirected to things that, that we know that's why they got into the profession, which is to help students. Great. And one of their concerns was, I'm sorry, Chairman. <laughs> Go right ahead. <laughs> that was one of their concerns, you know, that, that if it wasn't coming, they they have, we all know it like I do, that they spend so much time doing paperwork and reporting that they want to spend time with kids. So I appreciate that clarity and, uh, and uh, on that topic. So that's all for me on round one, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Chairman Reagan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have about five questions for you. Yes, sir. Uh, one of our previous witness, witnesses mentioned dollars versus effective dollars, the implication being that uh, we make the assumption that this formula you've got is going to work perfectly and we get the dollars allocated uh, to the uh, students as is indicated by the plan with the caveat that it's a funding formula, not a spending formula. Uh, but the, the, the implication there is what are we getting for it? The, the implication that I'm trying to get out of this is even if we do this perfectly, mm -hmm. which is certainly up for question, but even if we do this perfectly, what is the effect of dollars if we fund this exactly right? So can you address that for me? Yeah, you know, I'm happy to. I think there's, I, I would want to do it on the input side and then certainly on the output side. So when you think about the inputs and what these dollars can fund, we hear from districts um, constantly in different regions of the state that say, you know, I would love to have a slightly smaller class size for my youngest learners to really focus on literacy. I really want to make sure that I can invest in contemporary equipment and machinery for my CTE programs to funnel into the jobs that are available in my community. There are really important investments that I, I know districts will make in a very strategic way. Way because they've been thinking about this for a long time, and there's ongoing professional development, conversations, reviews, and things that we do as part of that transparency and accountability. I think the other side is that output. So what do you then get when you invest in smaller class sizes or high dosage tutoring or equipment and machinery or whatever those decisions are at the local level? We can look at that data, and for the first time, because we now have that, that much more transparent line of sight into spending, we can say and help districts look at, you invested this these dollars in these inputs, here's the output that came from that. 
Is that something that you expected? Is that better than you expected? And maybe you want to put more funding into that? Is that not actually what you expected and we need to redirect those funds in a different way? You're able to have that conversation and make those strategic decisions in a way that's really difficult to do under the BEP. I think it does allow for, for more strategy there. That being said, in terms of the quality of the inputs, that is also something that we heard from the subcommittees in terms of additional support. So we know that every teacher in a classroom every day is working as hard as he or she can for in the best interest of their children and their students. We know that. And we also heard from the teacher subcommittee and many of our other subcommittees that additional professional development can continue to help our teachers thrive and be successful. I think there was some conversation on, on the, literacy, the Literacy Success Act that was passed last year. We are already seeing really strong, positive effects of that. The additional funding helps us to accelerate that work. So depending on where the investment is, the real transparency piece and connecting those dollars into what those investments are helps for better decision making year over year. Chairman Reagan. Thank you. Um, not sure I phrased my question exactly to get the answer that I was looking for here. Uh, nothing detrimental about what you said, but we sit here in the legislature, we look at things like ACT scores. Mm -hmm. We compare that across, I'm going to say 141 districts, because when you take out school for the deaf, school for the blind, et cetera, you have about 141 districts left that, there, that we can compare. So we compare performance there. My question is related to performance. You were talking about, for example, they get results in CTE. Well, if I'm looking at Stewart County and I want to compare their performance in CTE to Hamilton County mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. perhaps uh, uh, Anderson County, Knox County, pick one, how do I do that? Because you've just enunciated that they're going to be spending this all differently. So what, what standard of comparison do we have to ensure that we're getting the bang for the buck. Yes, sir. So uh, appreciate that clarification. So what, what I would say is we have a pretty robust accountability system. Um, we'll be rolling out, of course, letter grades um, this August, but it has a series of different accountability metrics. So we look at performance and growth on all of our end of year assessments. We look at ACT performance. We also look at how many students earned uh, industry credentials, how many students earned statewide dual credit, dual enrollment, or other types of post-secondary credits. We now, for the first time this year, thanks to, I think, a a, some really, really good work on our assessment and accountability team, we will have individual student TVOS scores. And that means at the individual student level, we'll be able to measure that growth over time in a very different way and frankly report to families um, and have that transparency for families. So all of those are different outcome indicators that we currently publicly report on. We provide a different level of data confidentially with districts and families, um, but that we can now tie towards dollars invested in a way that we certainly can't do uh, right now. And I will just add that the ACT work keys that, uh, is, that seniors can take right now, if that continues to somehow stay along the way, we can use that to track some of the CTE success. Mm -hmm. I'll just add quickly. <laughs> Chairman Reagan. Yes. All right. Instead of asking you five questions, I've asked one, got, had a follow-up, so I'm only going to ask one more. Uh, I've been getting uh, lots of questions from my district, Oak Ridge, which has the highest paid teachers in the state, and that's a, f a function of the fact that the city is very proud of their school systems and they put a lot of money in it. Yes, they do. Uh, so I have been getting questions from uh, city officials as well as citizens there uh, as to local match impacts. And I, we, we've talked about the, the hold harmless or nothing changes for the first whatever it is, three or four years. Uh, but their concern is that, you know, they're already putting in a lot. And when this funding formula changes and there's four years of catch up, as someone else mentioned earlier, uh, under the maintenance of effort category, what's going to happen to them? And I, I, would, I dare say that applies also to Davidson County and some others who put in a lot of money because it's not just a question of how much they put in. There's that maintenance of effort piece. So how's that going to be calculated? What's going to be the impact? Yes, sir. So um, I will give the maintenance of effort and then go to the actual district. So at the maintenance of effort level, the current uh, legislation keeps that the same as it is now, meaning if a, if a district puts in... $10 million more than what their uh, minimum required match is, that they will still have to maintain that level of funding over time. So the maintenance of effort, the vast majority of our districts put in more than the BEP requires. That amount they have to put in year over year. So they have to keep that, that full dollar amount. 
when you look at, um, and I just want to be really clear about kind of this idea of a fiscal cliff, that is not what happens. We have not frozen anything, and I think it's that idea that we have frozen the local um, contribution or that, that a dollar amount. What we've actually done is we've lowered that amount. And so every year it still increases. It's just lower than what people spend now. We've essentially lowered the bill. And so every year, maybe the bill was, um, and, and we can get, actually we should probably pull up the exact numbers. If the bill that locals are putting in is $2 billion, we've actually set that now to 1.5 billion. It's still gonna go up by 65 million each and every year, but because we set it lower, it doesn't catch up to current funding levels until fiscal year 27. That's why so many districts, when we gave them their projections out to fiscal year 30, that's why so many were lower. Even when you put in $100 million a year, year over year, you are still seeing that that is going to be lower than what they would do under the BEP. We've run that analysis for TISA. We've run it for TISA adding $100 million. We certainly don't want to be presumptuous about more investment, but if that was the case. And we've run that with the BEP putting a $1 billion into the BEP year over year through fiscal year 30. So for a, for a district like Oak Ridge, they do put in a, a significant amount above the BEP. What you would see for them is that they will still see those increases just like they would under the BEP, but in fact, we've set that to a lower dollar amount. So they're getting that difference before they actually catch up to where the current formula would require them to pay. Chairman Reagan. Thank you. I, in the interest of time, as well as my colleagues here, I'll, I will defer my questions on other things till later. Thank you. Yes, sir. Chairman Sapicki. Um, continuing on. Yes, sir. Page 11 of the bill. 15, 591, page 11, at the bottom. And, and speaking for myself, it is very difficult to come in on a Monday and be looking at a new amendment and new bills on this. What I would request is, if this bill does move forward today, that let us digest where we are as a committee, like an entire committee, and in the full committee, let us put together what we believe that we can get across the finish line, and then let the department and the, and the governor's office take a look at it, and then whatever whatever the department or the office administration doesn't like, then everything else we agree on, and start focusing on our differences to try to close that gap up, because it's very frustrating to keep coming in here on a Monday and having to figure out where we are every week, instead of let us get a working document for you, and then you just tell us, yeah, everything is good except for these things, then the only conversation we're having is what, what those things are, and that's it. So that's, that's my speech. But on page 11 at the bottom, it says three directors of schools on 15591. Oh, yep, yes, sir. <laughs> I would, I, and, and one suggestion that'll probably be made here is, because there's differences all across the state, we have one rural, one urban, and one suburban right there. Yes, sir. Page 12. An LEA that, exp um, 40, 493107, fast growth stipends, in section B there, it talks about uh, an LEA that experienced growth in total allocation generated by students in non-virtual schools in the current year, right? So August shows up and all of a sudden an LEA has a big growth. Mm -hmm. How do we fund that? Because, um, because that's yeah. after we've already funded the budget. Yes, so is that um, are currently or, or in, in this bill? How are we going to do it in, in TISA? Yes, sir. So what we do is we allocate the funds specifically for that purpose, and so they are appropriated for that year. And then looking at the students, um, the number of students who would qualify, we, we allocate those dollars in that current year. So that, that fast-growing section, which is why it's slightly separate from the formula, is for current year funding specifically. But I think the benefit is that right now we do that um, on a pretty, there's a lot of space between those payments. We are actually going to increase that to five payments per year. So districts get that funding more regularly throughout the year to cover those expenses. And if we don't use that money in the bill, it talks about that money would, would roll to the department to use for outcome-based funding, correct? Um, yes, sir, that's right. Okay. Page 13, uh, distribution of funds starting with section B. Yes, sir. So this is what has a lot of us concerned about the, the, the cliff here, because the 100% every year, it drops 25% of making an, a district whole here, okay? Can you just run us through how that works in four years? Yes, sir. So um, that, that's helpful. So this, this section is specific only to that very small group of districts that have seen significant enrollment decline. 
those are districts that even, you know, for, for the most part under the BEP, they are kind of losing money because they've, they've reduced enrollment, some in double digit percentage percentages. So what this does is it says whatever you were funded at in fiscal year 23, especially for those districts, again, that over the last three years have seen significant enrollment declines, we will give them that stair step down to be able to right size over those four years, as opposed to frankly, how it works now, which is kind of, you're just cut. So this is, this section is really only for that very small handful of districts. I think it's five, and I'm gonna check with Sam to make sure that's correct. Five districts total. Everybody else this section does not apply to. Just okay. enroll, those significant enrollment decline districts. Um, Chairman Zabigi? And, and, and um, six, excuse me. <laughs> there's, there's, we could go, I, I'm gonna be conscientious here of everybody's time, but um, you know, you and I have talked about this is we, as a state, we cannot be where we are right now in three years. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what the conversation would be if we're at the same literacy rates, the same graduation rates, the same ACT scores in three years after this pretty much unprecedented investment in education. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we're gonna have to figure out is, you know, and I don't think a yearly evaluation is almost fair mm -hmm. because there's so much work that has to be done it almost looks like we have to do it in like three year increments to allow the LEAs to adjust, implement, and move, mm -hmm. right? And after three years, there has to be something, some measurement for an LEA to say, okay, you were at 28% literacy rate three years ago. For your district, we're looking at your, your, your metrics, your data, you have to be at 35 in three years or 37, right? Because Germantown, at the high, or Oak Ridge, who's performing at a high level, you just can't arbitrarily say we need eight points in, 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 in three years. That's gonna be virtually almost an impossibility <laughs> for some of these districts. And so one of the things I wanna make sure we're working on, and it's nothing in the bill, this is where the devil comes out in the details that one of my colleagues talked about, is we've got to have some way to have accountability is if we're gonna give this maximum autonomy at the beginning, there has to be a time there where we come in and as evaluate and say, okay, hey, you're hitting the mark, keep your autonomy. Or you're not, and now there has to be oversight on that district to, to, to do best practices. That's kind of more of a statement there. Yes, sir. Um, and then lastly, I wanna throw this out to you, is my colleague from Davidson County talked mm -hmm. about cost of living. Mm -hmm. As a mortgage banker, it's just been announced that in Williamson County, the average cost of a home for sale right now is $1 million. One million. In Murray County, it is increasing at a rapid rate. Mm -hmm. Cost of living is going to be a very real thing here in Middle Tennessee and other parts of the state, like uh, 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 Chairman Hurt. When that Ford plant starts to come online, the GM plant we have in Spring Hill has 13 schools around it within, within 10 miles, 13 schools. So these are things that we have to consider going forward is there has to be some safeguards in here because if not, our local match is going to have to go up, have to go up. And then that makes it very difficult for me to sit here and vote for a bill that I know is going to require a tax increase on my c c constituents in my district. So more of a statement, but thank you. If, if I can, since that's come up a couple times, if I can, so I want to make sure, so let, regardless, so if it's just under the BEP, what's happening in, in kind of Blue Oval City, what's happening in, in Middle Tennessee, et cetera, that, the, the fiscal capacity calculation does not change. So if we kept things exactly the same and all of those places had increasing property values and explosions of populations, their fiscal capacity requirement will increase under the BEP. That, that, is, just, that is how fiscal capacity works. It is constitutionally required we do that because of case law previously. And so I think there were a couple of things on that. I think there was a kind of the assume the ability the department does not calculate fiscal capacity. Two independent organizations and agencies do, and we average those. But it is based on real data that is collected from local counties. So looking at actual property taxes collected, actual sales tax revenues that are collected. So those real dollars are the calculations. I 100% agree we have some places in the state where the fiscal capacity balance is, is gonna shift because they are growing and property values are going up. I will also say for a lot of our rurals right now, their sales tax revenues went went pretty high because of the pandemic, because of the bill that was passed to be able to do the sales tax on those online purchases. And so we're seeing some shifts in real time. I think what I just wanna make sure to be really clear about is that the 
the TISA versus the BEP on that does not change the fiscal capacity. That is going to happen no matter what. The thing that we are able to do under TISA as a state is to actually say, because there is this billion dollar investment, it allows us to lower that bill for districts and it gives them more time for some of these changes that are happening because Tennessee is in such an economic boom. It actually controls for those local increases in a way that does not exist under the BEP. So that is something that I would say is actually a benefit. And that's why when you look at those projections year over year, um, it, is, it is something that I, I would say is, is one of the things that um, is going to be good for locals. Representative Hurt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just kind of a question explanation here. On, when we look at the weighted allocations, yes, sir. Um, there's obviously a couple categories there, different percentages. And uh, we have a significant amount of money going towards CTE, which I think we're all good for, we're good with. Um, but on the other side of that, when you talk about the academic side, we have schools that have made, and even as a General Assembly, we've made uh, you know, commitments to increasing the, the dual credit money. Um, uh, we've got, you know, schools that have made drastic commitments. They're grad, you know, students graduating with associate's degrees mm -hmm. um, and, and multiple d dual credits. So we're not seeing any weight for that. Did that cross the department's mind to put any weight in that side of it? Or, in, and obviously it, it's not on there, but, you know, why wasn't it? I'd like to. Uh, that's a that. great question. Um, one of the reasons is we looked at the source of the funds and where those funds currently sit in the budget. So some of the examples that you gave actually filter through THEC or a different organization. Same thing with summer school. Summer school came up a lot in the conversations to put, can we put that in the formula? Because so much of that summer school funding is funded through TANF. It isn't specific to the formula itself. And so we tried to keep things that were reflective in current state budgets or grants that were standalone administered solely by the department. So that's, that's part of the, the decision making that was there. Representative Hurt. Thank you. Let me, I guess, ask it, ask it the wrong way. The outcomes mm -hmm. side of it, um, on okay. that end of it, where we're, you know, with, with certified certifications, we're rewarding and things, but why not on reward a school for has a, you know, when students receive associate's degrees or, you know, pursue dual see. credits on the academic side of it. I see. Apologies, sir. So one of the things, um, and this was some feedback we received from the steering committee and then that subcommittee process was we had originally had a very long list um, of outcomes. And I think that was represented in that initial draft framework. The feedback that we received was to get that a lot tighter. And so what we heard was strong emphasis on literacy, um, as, as we can appreciate given, given the investments here. And then the second was a college track and then a college and career track. And so they had looked to say what is the outcome that we would want to see there. One of those measures for college readiness was that ACT mark of 21 or the significant improvement between the first test and the retake. The second was on that college and career track and that was earning in tier two or tier three industry credentials. And so it encompassed more students than just looking at an assessment. It also looked at assessments that were more aligned to those CTE programs of study. I think certainly there were conversations on statewide dual credit and, and AP scores and all of that. For this initial proposal, the idea was to keep that pretty streamlined. That being said, before any of that would happen, we would go through that rulemaking process um, with, I think, all the folks listed in, in the bill, um, reviewed by the state board and then going to government operations. So there's still, um, I think, the next 15 months, if this were to pass, where all of that feedback would be considered from a larger group of, of stakeholders besides just kind of the folks you see here. Yes, sir. Representative Love. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Commissioner. I, th I think none of us are, are saying that the BEP calculation for fiscal capacity was the best it could be. I think what many of us are saying is while we are fixing or making our funding formula better, then see if we can find some way to even out the state's contribution to the locals. I've heard for years folks complain about the fiscal capacity model of BEP. And so I think we get it that it's, it's if we left it alone, we'd be talking about we should have fixed it. And the main piece would be the fiscal capacity piece. And I, I've tried my best to explain to folks this whole fiscal capacity piece. And so I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I know for myself, that's what I'm saying, which is I know that it's not the best model um, to use, but we also know that in, in this new funding model, we've improved other areas. We've improved areas around accountability. We've improved areas around 
weights for students. Yes, and, and, and so while we're fixing, um, don't take new icing and put on an old cake. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate the continuation of the cake analogy. Maybe I'm just hungry today. <laughs> Any other questions for our guests? Representative Clemens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got a couple of questions about the direct allocations and the outcome incentives. Yes, sir. <clears throat> well, first, let me start with this fiscal cliff. So you're saying, you keep saying you're lowering the bill f for the four years and it inc incrementally increases, but I've heard no assurances in your four. And in your testimony in the last hearing, I asked you if your position was that the counties are not going to have to raise property taxes to compensate for their local share at the end of four years. And you said, quote, that is not what I'm saying. So I keep hearing you say this over and over, but all the signs point to the fact that counties are going to be stuck with a higher bill at the end of four years or before, depending on fiscal capacity. So oh, I appreciate that we're taking this down a notch, but it seems like we're just buying a little time here. But meanwhile, that fiscal capacity is going to change in a lot of counties. You're going to have different outcome incentives. You're going to have all these different weights kicking in. You're, you're not buying them time to adjust. You're just delaying the inevitable because you're not addressing the inherent problems with the current BEP. I, I, I mean, it seems like the biggest argument for passage of this is that, well, this is going to delay the inevitable. But the inevitable could be avoided if we changed, like really spent some time working through this and changing the fundamental problems that an earlier witness said were not even addressed by this. So at the end of four years, what is going to happen? What is guaranteed? Yes. So I, I, I do want to acknowledge because I think there's a few things that were that are getting clumped together that are completely different conversations. So at the state level, we have projected for at, through fiscal year 30. We, in our assumptions in those projections, we assumed the 1% ADM growth and we assumed a $100 million increase to the base. That's that is what we assumed in those five-year projections. And that's an assumption that this body is going to do that. That, that's correct, which is why when we sent out the district allocations, we are not, we do not want to presume that on your behalf, but we have still run those so we can answer questions certainly that have come up like today. So for those projections, and this is the same sheet that I know um, many of you have looked at, for fiscal year 24, it does show that for the state, we would put in $6.37 billion. Locals would put in $2.5 billion. In fiscal year 23, which is next fiscal year, Locals are putting in 2.645. So we went from 2.645 in the what would be hypothetically the last year of the BEP, 2.645 billion. And then in the first year of TISA, that declines to 2.5 billion. So we essentially set that local dollar lower. What happens is the next year it goes from 2.5 billion to 2.57 billion to 2.643 billion in fiscal year 26. All of those years are still lower than fiscal year 23, the last year of the BEP. It doesn't catch up to where we are in the BEP until fiscal year 27. So we have set that total amount lower. We've controlled for those costs to be lower. It is still increasing. It is every year, but it doesn't hit where we are now until fiscal year 27. So that, I just want to be very, very clear. And that assumes $100 million in the base and everything that happens with the weights. And it assumes fiscal capacity that is, frankly, stagnant. So it's that 70-30, and we are using the TASR-CBER split. That TASR-CBER split, that is what would happen in terms of how much your locals would need to put in to, comp to cover that $2.5 billion, $2.56 billion, et cetera. But that, so it, it, there is no cliff. We have set the bar significantly lower from what it is now, and the state is making up that difference. Representative Clemens? But all of that is based on assumptions. Of and additional nothing funding. Nothing is guaranteed. That, that is a problem. If we go back to our counties and say this is what's going to happen, we can't make that promise. That's not guaranteed. But that is a good thing for your counties, right? So this assumes more money into the base, which so it is assuming the highest amount your counties would have to put in. If you do not put in more dollars, that means your counties would be putting in less than what we are projecting out. So, so we are giving kind of, unless you all put in more than $100 million, and, and certainly when it goes through the weights, it ends up being you know more than that. But we are making that assumption of that kind of hundred and, let me see, I can give you the exact 
$217.7 million for state and local, $154 million total in state. If you invest that every year, those are the numbers I just put in. If you all choose not to invest more every year, your county bill is lower than what I just said. So we are giving you kind of that worst case scenario at the county. It is still lower than what they put in today. That is, that is just a fact. Representative Clemens. But that's not necessarily true with, for counties that are already putting in more and will continue to need more as they see more growth and more factors. So that doesn't necessarily apply across the board. Um, so, so I would say that's a, that's so. What you're talking about is the fiscal capacity ca um, component. Mm -hmm. That is different than the formula. And I just want to be really clear: we have to separate those two conversations. The formula is how much money is provided for the children in a district. Fiscal capacity is totally separate, and that is just how you divide up the pie. That division is not going to change in terms of those percentages. That will be the same under any formula. What I am saying is that because the state is putting more money in and reducing that local bill, how the locals divide up that pie is on a lower total dollar amount, which is why the majority of our districts end up doing really well in additional state dollars. And those who are just doing the minimum every year are still gonna do, do okay because we've lowered their total bill. I cannot, of course, under the BEP or TISA, control for growth or what the future will hold. We can project on the information that we have today just like we do with the BEP or any other formula. Representative Clemens. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So again, getting to unknowns. So with regards to direct allocations, subsection C on page nine, you're, the department's gonna promulgate rules um, to set direct allocation amounts. Um, we don't know what those amounts are gonna be. Um, that, that is concerning. Uh, to me, we also have other issues with regards to funding that you're going to determine with regards to student outcome incentives, what those outcome goals are going to be, what those outcome incentive dollars are going to be. That makes it very hard for districts to plan out on, on those dollar amounts, what those incentives are. Why are you shaking your head no? Because no, we don't wanna, know what that's going to be. I, well, I just want to clarify is that the department is not deciding the dollar amount. We are required to promulgate rules. You all will decide the dollar amount. You will do that through the appropriations bill. We essentially have to do rulemaking that is a direct reflection of how much you all choose to appropriate. We don't have the authority to appropriate funds. Well, that's a concern of mine because the language says you'll promulgate rules to set the direct allocation amounts pursuant to the subsection. And then it says you're going to submit the proposed outcome goals, which will have a direct income, and you're gonna appoint this committee unilaterally to regarding outcome incentive dollars tied to those goals. So I guess I would like some clarification on what that's gonna be. Sure, so on the direct allocation, part of that rulemaking is because all of that needs to go in the TISA guide. So essentially, uh, the rule is putting the dollar amounts that you all choose to appropriate every year, we put that in the TISA guide. That is, that is a direct kind of transfer over. In terms of the outcomes component, it, it is prescriptive in terms of the minimum uh, folks who would be part of that committee every year. That is, again, we've put out kind of an initial starting draft um, to be able to show where the thinking is based on the feedback from the steering committee. One of the things is if this were to pass, that outcomes committee would need the rulemaking around that and what that looks like starts immediately. So that as we go into next school year, that is very clear, but it's 15 months worth of time to be able to set what those look like in rule. Now for the outcomes component that is slightly different than the formula, I would never tell a district that they should bank on the same amount every single year because it is based on performance within that year. I think many of our districts can look at trends over time. I do know there are a number of districts who have already started to look at what they might generate based on an initial starting point. So it is one-time funding year over year. The formula, which is base plus the weights plus the direct, that is essentially the entitlement funding that districts receive as a result of the students who are enrolled in their district. So is that direct allocation funding intended to be recurring or are they gonna change it year after year? The, the direct allocation is recurring. You all would have the opportunity, of course, and if you wanted to make adjustments, then that would be just like any other recurring funds that's built into the, the base of the state budget. You always have that flexibility, of course. So will there be enough limits? funding to implement the entire programming required by the state rules or will districts have to shift the base and weight level funding to support the programming mandated by the direct allocations? 
So everything that is currently within the bill and that we've projected out through fiscal year 30, we have done based on the funding that has been uh, made available. So that is based on the additional investment, certainly of the billion dollars. It also assumes, and we've, we've worked with FNA on this, that this is within the, the fiscal um, kind of boundaries of, of what the state is comfortable with. So we do feel that the full formula can be funded through the projection year, which is fiscal year 30. And two more questions, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, quick ones. Um, with regard to the student outcome incentives, I have a real yes, fear sir. that we're going to be incentivizing systems with fewer struggling kids and that these outcome incentives are going to lead to schools that are already struggling, receiving even less funding than other systems. Can you say anything that's going <laughs> to reduce those fears? Yes, sir. And I, I will say that both in terms of the bill, but also as someone who has worked exclusively in Title I schools um, her entire career. And that is that we have put double the funding towards economically disadvantaged students. So if you have a student who's economically disadvantaged, the initial proposal that obviously we have to go through rulemaking in the committee and, and feedback and, and, and all of that. But right now what we have budget is that if you are a student who's economically disadvantaged, you would receive a double in terms of that outcomes funding. Also, we've looked at growth and improvement. So at the ACT level, if students improve over that ACT score, that still also in, it provides additional support there. So I'm an economically disadvantaged student. I show improvement on the ACT. I would get double the funding as, as someone who's not economically disadvantaged. I also think what's really important is tier two and tier three industry credentials. When we look at students um, in across our state, urban, suburban, and rural, who are involved in, in our CTE programs and frankly our exceptional CTE programs, programs, this does ensure that those students who earn those tier two and tier three credentials, that is that can be any student, but it still provides that double funding for economically disadvantaged students. So it is not just a test score, it is also looking at other measures. Um, and that's why I do feel like it is inclusive, especially in that high school space. Last question, question. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, and so the way I'm reading this is that a lot of this funding isn't going to be allocated until the 24-25 school year because it's based on data in the preceding year that the bill actually goes into effect, which is 23-24. So what are we going to do between now and year 24-25 with regards to school funding? Um, because I don't know how you would allocate these dollars when you've got provisions in here saying they're based on data collected in the preceding year once this bill goes into effect. So the data collected, it, good question, the data collected in the preceding year is the 22-23 school year. So that data is used for the first year of the formula, which would be the 23-24 school year. The dates that you see in terms of reports, et cetera, also reflect that implementation year. Again, that's 23-24. Okay, maybe... Um, misreading this, but I thought that this bill wasn't supposed to go into effect until the 23-24 school year, and then that would trigger the collecting the data once the bill is in effect and push the implementation to 24-25. Uh, no, no, sir. The, so the clarification there is we collect the same data. So there's no new additional data collections. It's the same data we collect now. This this year would be, hypothetically, if this passed, the last year of the BEP. And then the 23-24 school, school year would be the first year of TISA implementation. We are still using that same data that we collect under the BEP. It's the same data elements that are collected under TISA. Still prior year, so there there aren't changes in in that operational component. It's just what formula are you applying those data points to? And so that would be we have a 15 month essentially window from hypothetical passage until the actual implementation where the new funding model would be implemented. Okay, um, and I guess I would ex I would assume or expect that you wouldn't start acting pursuant to this bill until it was actually in effect. That's my, I guess, the difference of understanding. So it would go into effect upon the upon uh, passage and governor's signature, but we would actually start with kind of that, that full rulemaking effective immediately. Okay. Chairman Watt, final thoughts for our guests? Okay. So <laughs> here's my thought, my question. Yes, sir. And you correct me if I'm way off base. Yes, sir. And I appreciate all these comments. This is very, very good as, we, as we're going through this process. This is why this, this is good for us. But it appears to me that a lot of our concerns would still be concerns moving forward without TISA. That's right. The same concerns under the BEP formula, moving the next three years on student accountability and performance are still with us, right? Yes, sir. So... 
every year we're in education committee, we're looking for 40 million recurring for nurses to put the, the nursing ratio down. Normally we can't find it. We're looking for an extra 100 million to give teachers a thousand dollar a year raise. Mm -hmm. It takes about 100 million for every thousand dollars recurring. And therefore it dies in finance because it's not in the budget. And, and the maintenance of effort on the locals is still going to continue to go up as we as a state continue to put more money in education and grow. So my comment is whether we move to a TISA model, which I do see more accountability and transparency in it, or we stay right where we are, we still got a lot of the same issues that we're concerned about in this committee, which are all really good concerns. We need to flush them out. So that's my concern. You know, we can stay right where we are, and I think we're going to keep doing band-aiding BEP year after year after year until there comes a point in time we either have to because it's not working and or the courts tell us to because someone has a, has a suit. Is that a fair statement? I think it is, and I, I would I would um, just highlight the specific point that the things, and, and again, really good and important questions, the things that seem to be the biggest um, concerns and, and I think um, important considerations really do have to, to deal with fiscal capacity. Um, that's where I think the majority of the questions when we look at that local contribution, local taxes, things like that, that is a that is something that is applied in every state. I can appreciate the, kind of the challenges around that. Um, there's lots of good conversation to be had on on kind of policy recommendations related to floors and ceilings and, and how that's calculated. But ultimately, BEP, TISA, or something else, fiscal capacity is applied no matter what in any formula. That is separate from how much money is generated for students. And so, if we are just looking at the formula. Again, realizing fiscal capacity is a completely different conversation. The formula generates more funding for students who need more supports in order to meet the very rigorous benchmarks that, that we have for them. And, and I think to Chairman Sapicki's point, that we should have and that we must have if we're going to continue to accelerate as a state. The conversation around fiscal capacity is a very important one. We, I think to Representative Clement's uh, point, we did make a recommendation on what we thought was best practice nationally, appreciate kind of the, the really good productive con conversations on that, and can appreciate kind of additional conversation on that particular element. BEP, TISA, or something else, it's still going to apply. What I want to make sure we don't lose sight of is that if this is a student-based formula, we have to make sure we are focused on students. And students in this formula generate more funding than they do under the BEP. Students who need more supports generate more funding under this formula than they would under the BEP. And that empowers our educators to provide that really exceptional academic instruction that they do every day. And that is what we are laser focused on and think it's really important that we don't lose sight of. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That's a great motion. All right. Thank you for joining us. Without objection, we will be going back into session. Two minute recess.
All right, we are back in session. We are back uh, for anybody that lost count of where we were in the calendar. We're on item number one. <laughs> House Bill 2143 by Chairman White. Uh, Chairman White, do you have uh, any remarks before we uh, open it up uh, for any questions for the sponsor or comments? No, thank you. I appreciate the, the discussion. I appreciate us going this two and a half hours. We really need this. And as we uh, move forward, I, I think we got a lot of a good discussion today and hope the committee is, uh, has enough good understanding that we can uh, go ahead and move this, this bill forward and uh, have fuller discussion in a, the larger committee. Chairman Sapicki. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So as you've seen, we've had a long, lengthy debate here and discussed this and a lot of questions continue to arise as we're, as we're moving forward. Um, and we are right. This is one of our major expenditures in the state of Tennessee, and we have to be very cautious with this moving forward because this is one, no matter what happens, we can't get wrong. There's a million students in Tennessee that are depending on us to get this right. But we have beat this horse hard today. And I think uh, the department knows that there's probably a lot more questions coming at the full committee. Um, by no means, though, I think we're across the finish line yet, but um, I think cautiously we can move forward. And, and uh, I would like to make a motion to send this to the full committee to continue this discussion. Second. I'm going to, we didn't really have a question on the bill on that, but go ahead and withdraw if you don't mind. I did have Representative Clemens that had, I had said to him that he would be quick on his 10 second comment. So Representative Clemens. Withdraw. Thank you. And Chairman Hurt, you're good. I'm counting 10 seconds. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, my, I guess the main point here is, you know, this has been a six month process. This is rushed. I don't think we have to keep doing the BEP every year and or past TISA. I don't think this is an either or proposition. I think that we can take our time, work together and make the fundamental changes that we need to make to the BEP and that address the inherent flaws of the BEP while taking the good ideas of this bill. I, you know, we spent two and a half hours today. We spent an, I guess two hours a couple of weeks ago. This is a huge piece of legislation. It's going to affect every child in the state and future children in the state. I don't understand what the rush is. There are so many unanswered questions. This is a largely contingent upon rulemaking and many other factors that we don't know. And you can't go to your counties and tell them a definitive answer on in most of this stuff. It, I'm hard pressed to vote for a piece of legislation like this momentous in, in this posture or even move it along. And I really do not think we should view this as an either or proposition. I think we can work together, take our time, address the inherent flaws of the BEP, take the good parts of this and come up with a real plan. But we don't have to do it in six months. We, we, we can do this together. This committee could do that in, in the next year. That's all I have to say, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Well, Chairman Sapicki. Um, by no means, I don't want anybody to confuse my motion to move this forward with a yes vote on this bill. I think we've got a lot of questions that we still need to answer, but I think we're at a point right now where we probably need to bring other members of this committee in to, to look at this, because when you debate something for such a long period of time, you get so focused on where you are that you're missing some of the other nuances in the bill that other members may, may want to chime in on and give us an aha moment. Um, I don't think there's anybody here, I may, I may be speaking out of turn, I think there's people here that still have reservations about this whole plan and about the expediency of, of what the pressure we're getting from outside the General Assembly, from the executive branch to move this bill forward. Um, I, I am committed that I will not vote for this bill unless I believe it's for the best benefits of our students in Tennessee, period. Um, and that's that's my statement. So please don't confuse the motion to move this forward as one of of giving in or saying it's OK. I think that we need to have a discussion with the full Education Administration Committee and make sure that that we are ex exploring every opportunity. 
uh, Representative Clemens is correct. The, the decision may come back as, no, we're not going to do this this year. We're going to continue to fund the BEP and continue to work on this, or we can get this in a position that we're able to move it forward. So that lengthy, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to move this to the full committee. Second. I think we can have discussion on the motion. All right, without objection, we will be uh, voting on House Bill 21. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Representative Love, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make sure that uh, part of what I think Chairman Sapicki said earlier about an amendment in full is what we're going to do because I know procedurally sometimes uh, we don't put amendments on in full that substantially change the legislation. So I wanted to get some, some clarity and direction on that piece. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, there was an untimely filed amendment that, that I filed. It's um, drafting code 016294. My full intention is to put that amendment on the bill in the full committee. Now, there's going to be some other changes that are going to be added to it, but my full intention is to add that amendment in the full committee. And with anybody, anybody else that wants to tag anything on top of that would be more than welcome to and be, and be looked at as a friendly amendment. We need, to get, we need to get this, and like I stated earlier, every Monday we're coming in here with new amendments, new bills, and we're trying to figure out where we are. I think as a House, we need to say, this is where we are. Can we get to a point that we're comfortable with? And let, and let the department look at what our proposal is and then make, make recommendations off of that, and then we decide as a committee of whether or not we're going to take those recommendations or not. That, that's the intent. Representative Love? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was a clarity I needed. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Chairman Watt? Yeah, just, just for clarity, and, and I appreciate it. And I, I want everybody to, to understand where Representative Sapicki is coming from. We've had multiple conversations over the last number of years. He wants Tennessee to be number one in education. We all do. And so we want to get this right. And so I, I appreciate his comments. Uh, what I, in talking about this, this amendment, if we go take this on to full and you've got this 16294, would we have this, is it your, will that we would have discussion about where we are currently first before that so that the new members on the full education commission know where we are before we start bringing in things that uh, this committee has already discussed? Chairman Sapigi? Yeah, absolutely. I think we've got, I don't know how many other members, Chairman, you probably know, but there's a lot of members that aren't privy to the conversations we have. So before we get to the, to the amendment that I would be bringing asking you to probably sign on to is we need to get everybody up to speed of where we are. I, I would I would be venture to say that next week in education admin, because this I don't know what higher ed has done, but we this would be the only bill we'd move forward. This could be devoted to conversation to try to get the other members caught up. And then we can continue to have discussions. I'm in like I said once again, I'm in no hurry to get this thing across the finish line. I just want to make sure it's right for the students of Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, we will be voting on House Bill 2143. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. No. The ayes have it. On to full education. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. We stand adjourned.